as an uh, I we should start. Welcome to today's speech this symposium at the web conference. Uh, my name is Elena Zemidova, and uh, together with me today is Havas Krafmoli. We are sharing through the today's uh, symposium, and um, we have a very exciting program in front of us. We are now uh, physically in Lyon, which is very nice, and uh, we would be also happy to see all of you here, but um, the conference is uh, online, so we hope that you stay with us uh, through, through the whole day and uh, look at the presentations and also participate in the discussions. I will show you a program in a second, but before showing the program, I would like to introduce a little bit the aims of the PhD Symposium. So our aim is to provide platform for PhD students who work on web and related topics uh, who do interesting studies on the web content uh, to present, uh, to receive feedback on the ongoing research. So we have today PhD students in this room who are at the beginning of their PhD and also in the more advanced phases. And then uh, we are looking forward very much to the exchange. Uh, we had to make very difficult choices. We had received uh, 22 submissions with an interesting uh, research discussions and results and uh, we couldn't accept everything so obviously we had to make some choices and we uh, managed to accept 10 papers and the topics are related to the conference topics and they cover different aspects so we have papers on knowledge graphs we have uh, papers on spark queries on retrieval and in interaction with information on the web. So we are looking very much forward to the exciting program today. So speaking of the program, so we have uh, sessions in the morning and in the afternoon. So now we will start with a few presentations in the, uh, we broadly try to cluster them in topically the papers. So we have Today's first session is about knowledge graphs, and we have uh, several presentations regarding this. And uh, then we have a lunch break. And after the break, uh, we have a keynote uh, from Angela Bonifati from um, Lyon. So she will talk about query driven graph processing. And then we will continue with the presentations of the PhD students and uh, we have another break in the afternoon, and then later in the afternoon, we have a third session. So the second session is typically about Spark queries, and the last session will be about information representation and interaction, and we have a wrap up um, late in the late afternoon, so we should be finished by quarter after five. So we uh, hope that you stay with us till the end of uh, the day and that we will also have more participants maybe in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, so there's more details about the keynote, uh, but uh, the keynote is in the next session after after lunch. So I would like also to ask you if you have um, any questions when you start this session. So we, we planned around 20 minutes for each uh, slot, for each presentation. So I would like to ask PhD students who present their research to keep it to, let's say, 18 minutes maximum, so that you still have the possibility to have some questions and some discussions, so 15 to 18 minutes presentation. And then afterwards, I would like to ask everybody to ask questions, to participate in the discussion, to provide feedback, to maybe also provide comments, ideas. It's very welcome in this uh, setting today. And I think in this environment, it's very difficult to uh, track questions if they are written. Of course, if you want to write a question, you can do it on Zoom, but it's better if you actually speak up and participate in, in the discussion. Right? That makes it more lively. And if you, uh, the sessions are recorded, so if you, you should be aware of this, if you want to switch on your camera, that, um, you are also uh, recorded. But if you are in the discussion, of course, we appreciate to you know see people rather than like squares and things. So with this, I think I'm at the end of the introduction. And now I would like to ask our PhD students to um, step in and to continue with their presentation. So the first presentation we plan is from Alexander Perivalov, and it's about enhancing multilingual accessibility of question answering over knowledge graphs. So Alexander, um, can you try to share your screen? I will stop share mine. 
Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Um. Yeah, for some reason, when I share my screen, my microphone is deactivated. Um, can you see it right now? You need, um, yes, now I can, but you need to make it full screen. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Hello everyone, uh, I'm glad to present here today my PhD thesis um, at the web conference. Its name is Enhancing Multilingual Accessibility of Question Answering Over Knowledge Graphs. And I do this thesis together with my scientific supervisors, Professor Andreas Bot, Professor Axel Gonga. And I would like to start with a famous citation of Tim Berners-Lee um, about the web accessibility. So the power of the web is in its universality and the access by everyone regardless uh, of disability is an essential aspect. And today we will talk about the multilingual aspect of accessibility of question answering. But before I would like to introduce you quickly to the, um, our view to question answering. So we select two main paradigms of question answering. The first one is text-based, which forks over unstructured documents and the second is knowledge-based question answering, which mainly works on the structured data, for example, SQL databases, Sparkio knowledge graphs, so anything that can be queried. And uh, knowledge-based question answering systems aim to map a text or question to a semantic representation of queries to a knowledge base. And this work we particularly consider a subset of knowledge-based question answering, which is knowledge graph question answering. And here's an example of how a question could be mapped to a query. So the first query is the logical query. Uh, so in what city was Angela Merkel born? The second query is a Sparky query to DBpedia. So here we present how can we map this question to a structured query to a knowledge base. And of course, these images might trigger you. Maybe you work with these knowledge graphs every day. Maybe you've heard about it somewhere, but these are the knowledge graphs that are typically used for the general domain research knowledge graph question answering systems. Um, but what is the problem here? I would like to draw your attention to the um, left chart at first. Here we gathered statistics on the average length of the Wikipedia articles given the types human, city, public, company, historical event, body of water. And here we see that uh, obviously English, uh, English uh, articles are the longest ones. Despite we know that the English grammar may be not so complicated, so the English uh, sentences are not the longest ones. For example, I suppose German sentences are quite longer. Despite that, um, the most of the information, the most of the knowledge in Wikipedia, uh, given the statistics, are contained in the English Wikipedia. However, if you draw uh, attention to the right chart, uh, where we gather the data only uh, about the entities affiliated to Germany, for example, German cities, German people, uh, German events. Here we see that, of course, in German Wikipedia, there are much more information on these entities rather than English. But that's obvious, of course, people uh, in Germany or people in any other country know more about its own uh, entities, about its own cities. Despite that, we come to the conclusion that the languages that uh, people are able to speak really affect uh, their experience on the web. And this is called digital language divide in some uh, sources. And of course, uh, as we know that there are more than 7,000 languages spoken in the world, we observe that English uh, dominates in many not only natural language processing research communities, but I guess in the majority of research communities as well as in the web. And so one more motivation to study multilingual knowledge graph question answering is that um, even Google fails 
I would say. Uh, here I have um, asked as the same question, uh, how old is Donald Trump in four languages? The first was English, and here we see the typical answer of Google, uh, typical structured answer, which was correctly uh, presented. Here we have German language, the same answer in correctly represented way was shown in German. However, the other two languages that I took for the example, uh, there were no, actually no um, particular answer to the question. So even Google, sto Google told me back that he, uh, it cannot search an answer for this question. And these languages are actually not um, the smallest ones. Uh, for example, Belarusian language is spoken by five or six millions of people, Bashkir language is spoken by more than 1 million people. Still, um, I would say the best search engine in the world could not answer the questions in these languages. And I think it's true for many, many other languages. Maybe you can call, you can name some languages that you know, or maybe you had troubles uh, with Google uh, asking multilingual questions. But of course, the following important research questions are overlooked while creating a knowledge graph question answering systems. For example, how many people can really take advantage of high quality knowledge graph question answering system? Who are these people? How diverse are they? Are they live on one continent or maybe live in one particular country or speak one particular language and so on. So the goal of my PhD thesis is to enhance multilingual accessibility of question answering systems by study and systematize the approaches uh, identify current challenges, why can we not develop further and further, what are the obstacles, and of course we would like to provide the community with multilingual resources such as data sets, uh, language models, and systems. And the ultimate goal is to create a language agnostic methodology for developing such systems while answering the following research questions. For example, are all languages, language families, or writing systems are equally hard to model? Uh, is it better maybe instead to use machine translation? Uh, is it better to use one multilingual language model versus uh, several monolingual language models? And of course, how people ask questions in different languages, maybe the patterns are different. So um, given the related work in the past decade, there were not so many multilingual benchmarks created. Of course, we can highlight QOD9 that had um, actually many, many versions, nine versions. Um, and of course, this year will be another version of QOD. Here we have not so many questions, however, it has 10 different languages and works over DBpedia. Uh, the other data set is Rubik, uh, recently published data set that uh, has 3000 uh, questions, two languages. Unfortunately, one language was machine translated. And the third data set that I'm presenting here is uh, CWQ. Uh, it has many languages, uh, many questions, four languages. Unfortunately, all of them were, three of them were machine translated from English. And I would like to draw your attention to the word benchmarks because um, we all know that we can now train many multilingual uh, language models in unsupervised manner. We have a lot of uh, multilingual data in Wikipedia, unstructured uh, multilingual data. We can train these models, of course, in an unsupervised way, but we have a lack of actually um, trustworthy data to evaluate these um, systems, these models. So we are lacking of trustworthy benchmarks carried out by real humans. Uh, speaking about the systems, also not so many uh, multilingual systems we observed. Uh, here is the table that presents uh, some of the systems uh, from the related work. Um, we have observed that many of them are not accessible anymore. They have no API, they have no source code, so we cannot even evaluate them. We can just rely on the previous publications. Uh, however, this table was, of course, updated. It's not uh, complete here because we created a um, knowledge graph question answering leaderboard here, and you can access this leaderboard using the QR code. There you can see the complete uh, related work on the knowledge graph question answering. However, I will get back to it a little bit later. 
And here are the references. You can get them after my presentation. Um, so what are the results of our work so far? Um, we started with creating a multilingual KGQA benchmark based on QOD9. We improved this data set and increased its usability by the following actions. So we used original English questions of QOD9. We translate these questions uh, with the help of crowd workers and volunteers that were native speakers of different languages. And after that, other uh, crowd workers validate these questions and they were also native speakers of the corresponding languages. In this regard, we got a um, completely new data set in many languages. And uh, we also did an extra task. We transformed DBpedia Spark queries to Wikidata. So the following languages we obtained um, after our work, we have um, German here, we have French, Russian, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Belarusian, Bashkir, and Armenian language. Um, as I mentioned before, English questions were not changed. The questions in other languages from the original QD9 were completely replaced or eliminated because we observed um, that the quality was not so good. Um, we transformed DBpedia queries to Wikidata. And two main um, highlights of our data set is that a Belarusian language and Bashkir language are considered as endangered by UNESCO. So uh, we provide the benchmark actually with endangered languages. And actually, no uh, knowledge graph question answering uh, data were, was ever released in Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and Armenian languages. And this data set can be accessed by you using this QR code or using this link. Um, we also um, work in the direction of providing multilingual components to question answering. One of these components is expected answer type classifier. So expected answer type uh, module aims to say what the type of the answer a user expects to get. Uh, from the question answering system. And this component actually helps to significantly reduce the search space of the answer. So here we have an example without um, restriction by the answer type. We have 800 examples returned. And here with the answer type, we have only six. So of course, the search space is reduced dramatically. And in this regard, we used multi-level hierarchical classification approach. We used uh, three language models, multilingual language models, and we uh, participated with this architecture two times in uh, semantic answer type prediction challenge, where we had reasonable results uh, that are comparable to multi monolingual model, despite we use multilingual approach. Um, one very important work of us is the paper on machine translation for knowledge graph question answering, which we actually will present at the web conference uh, on Friday. Uh, this paper answers the research question, can machine translation be an efficient method for adapting knowledge graph question answering to new languages? To answer this question, we took our data set that I was talking about we took this data set and we took three uh, famous uh, question answering systems that supporting natively English, Russian, German, and French languages. And we also used machine translation tools in order to help these systems to answer questions in not supported languages. And we wanted to observe actually to what language it is better to translate. Is it better to translate uh, languages that are from the same language family, for example, is it better to translate um, uh, Ukrainian to Russian, for example, rather, rather than to English or French, because they are from the same language family, and so on. So we have, uh, we had many research questions in this regard. So this is the part of our evaluation table. Uh, only two languages are fitted to the slide. We have English and German here we, uh, as a source languages. The target languages are presented here. We have also the um, performance for the native support. And we have the slices for, for machine translation tools here, of course. And we have different metrics that we measured using a gerbil um, evaluation system for many, um, yeah, for all of the experiments. 
And our main observation was that despite the source language, despite um, yeah, any source language can be used. However, it is always better to translate any language to English because uh, the performance was actually always better while translating to English. And of course, if we use machine translation here, our observation was that it is not so important uh, to look at the source language. It is always important to look at the target language uh, as of course the English was uh, giving our the best question answering quality. And that is why uh, machine translation quality had a small correlation with question answering quality because actually it was really depending on how well question answering systems perform on a particular particular language in a native support mode. And the main problem of course of machine translation in this regard already is not um, the quality, uh, for example, using this metric. The main problem is that machine translation now corrupts name identities and name identities are of course very important in the process of answering questions. For the future work, we want to extend this, uh, this work in many, many dimensions. And we want to investigate, evaluate and propose name identity aware machine translation approaches in this regard. And we want to compare machine translation performance um, with monolingual or graph question answering systems. And the last resu result uh, that I want to present here is knowledge graph question answering leaderboard. Our motivation was that there is a lack of leaderboards for this research field. Um, the evaluation results typically are scattered. And this is, an, uh, this is the another try to systematize the research field. And uh, of course, we wrote a research paper on, on, this, uh, on this topic. However, very interesting uh, tree map chart that we have obtained there is presented here. So here we have um, the blocks that are corresponding to the number of citations. So the, the higher the square, the higher the rectangle, the more uh, citations got the data set or a system and the color corresponds to the F1 score, the average F1 score that was reported to a particular system or a data set. Um, you can access this leaderboard using this QR code. Uh, you can just check, uh, maybe you will find some familiar systems publications that you want to uh, compare with the other ones and feel free to, yeah, to ask the questions about this publication. So, where are we right now? On the data level, we have created a new multilingual knowledge graph question answering benchmark. On the component level, we created a multilingual expected answer type component, and we evaluated the knowledge graph question answering systems with the help of machine translation. On the meta-analysis level, we created a knowledge graph question answering leaderboard, and we are in progress of uh, creating a systematic review on this topic. For the future work, we, as I mentioned before, want to create a survey or a systematic review on this research topic. And we want to extend research on how people interact with chatbots and question answering systems. We want to release more multilingual resources to the research community with the focus on small languages. We want to create more individual components like expected answer type and machine translation. And of course, our ultimate goal is to propose a language agnostic approach for knowledge graph question answering system. So thank you for your attention. Uh, that was it from my side. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you very much, Alexander. I have a question. Looking at your results, it looks like your approach, it looks like you can solve everything with the multilingual question answering with machine translation to English, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I see that this has performance advantages, sure. Uh, but the question is, do you think uh, there are other problems behind it? Uh, because you started talking about accessibility and probably also accessibility of information to the user. And uh, if you translate everything to English, uh, you probably answer the questions over English knowledge graphs, right? Like English uh, DVPDA, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens to um, like 
knowledge which is encoded in other languages. If you have a um, query in uh, initial user question in a different language, let's say in German, mm -hmm. and, and maybe you want to access some German specific information which is not present in um, English uh, knowledge graph. So, mm -hmm. do you? Um, do you have any ideas of how that can be solved or how, which role does it play in your research? Yeah. Um, so at first I would like to mention that um, I'm not really uh, defending the machine translation approach. That is just a current observation that uh, it's the easiest way to solve multilingual problem right now. But of course, if, if we are talking about this particular problem that you're mention, mentioning, if we ask, for example, a question in German language, um, the system doesn't understand it, we translate it to English, let's say, and we ask um, English Wikidata, for example. We, of course, can um, provide the information of the initial language uh, through the through the yeah question answering pipeline and maybe we can in the final spark your query somehow specify that we are looking for uh, resources in german or in any um, initial language that was uh, in in what uh, the initial question was asked um, so i think we can we can utilize this information anyways and we can use this information to form a fi final uh, spark your queries such that the, the the data is actually retrieved in german and we don't have to translate it back and be and give back the translated data to user uh, so i am here maybe standing for the approach where native support of the languages or multilingual or language agnostic support uh, will uh, overcome the machine translation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as I... So, um, hello everyone. My name is Amethyst Miasman. I'm going to present my PhD proposal with the title of Enhancing Query Answer Completeness with Query Expansion Based on Silony Predicate under supervision of Professor Maria Savida. And first of all, we need to know what is the problem and why this problem is important. Also, we can see how we can solve this problem. So um, despite many efforts done by um, contributing communities to generate community-based knowledge graphs, um, such as Wikipedia, these knowledge graphs may be incomplete and also integrate duplicated and data and metadata. So um, these incomplete community-based knowledge graphs led to retrieve incomplete answers. In order to solve this problem, we need to propose an efficient query processing approach to uh, estimate answer completeness and increase the number of results. So our assumption um, here is that community-based knowledge graphs comprise synonym predicates that complement knowledge graph triplets required to raise query answer completeness. As an introduction, the um, frequent growth of entities in knowledge graphs impacts on query management tasks, such as query processing. Also, knowledge graphs based on open world assumption um, can be incomplete by default, which lets query engines to retrieve incomplete answers. Uh, information incompleteness is a main data quality issue that is aggravated by containing synonyms and duplicate data and metadata in the knowledge graph. Um, the aim here is proposing a novel query expansion method based on synonym predicates identified using embeddings models built top of the knowledge graph. As I said, before, and Wikipedia as a community-based knowledge graph may also suffer from incompleteness. So we motivate our work by considering a Sparky query over Wikipedia, which retrieves for Mari query resource, the name of relatives, institutes, and research fields. This query consists of three triple patterns and returns six answers. Uh, but these answers are not complete. For example, um, predicate relative is semantically similar to predicate child, but a relative relates Marie Curie to only F Curie, while child associates this resource with two entities, F Curie and um, Irna Juliet Curie, which is missed here. So to enable the answer completeness, both entities that represent Marie Curie's children should be part of relative as well. 
Query expansion can be used to enhance answer completeness. It's a process for rewriting and transferring query into other forms. Um, here is a query expanded by naive approach, include all the possible representatives for the predicate. Um, this returns 90 results. In this naive approach, each triple pattern is expanded by synonym predicates to return more answer. But the problem is many false positive answers can be found among these 90 answers. For example, alma mater and academic advisor found as a synonym, but they're not synonyms. Here, a uh, query expanded by a smart approach expands the query, the original query by detecting synonym predicates efficiently and consider only the ones which return the complete answer with less false positive answer as a final. Um, so our aim is expanding query with minimal synonyms to retrieve maximum answers. Um, consider RDF graph G and a Sparky query Q and ideal RDF graph. Um, ideal RDF graph, as an example, we can see here um, is a graph that all the triples are there and we can retrieve all the complete answers. Um, for example, we can see relative associate the Marie Curie resource to both children as a child pro uh, property. And the problem of enhancing query answering by expanding Q as QPrint should follow the condition that QPrint executed over G enhances answer completeness in comparison to the execution of Q against G. And also the retrieve answer should be exist in the ideal RDF graph because we want to compare with the um, ideal RDF graph. Here is our architecture, um, which receives a Sparky query and knowledge graph as an input, and the output is enhanced answer of the query. And the architecture comprises four components. Um, one is RDF um, completeness model, which estimates the completeness of the Sparky query uh, whenever it's evaluated against the knowledge graph. And since query expansion is an expensive task and always um, don't re retrieve the complete answer, so query expansion cost can be mitigated by estimating which queries retrieve complete answer in advance. The other component is the, uh, detecting synonym predicates, which is used for expanding the queries um, comprises two main tasks. And one is generating candidate set and the other is pruning them. So detecting these synonym predicates can be done by several techniques such as a knowledge graph embedding, association rule, and so on. Also, there are many techniques for embedding um, to find these representati representatives in the, uh, for the properties. Um, in knowledge graph embedding, the candidate sets are generated by um, converting these properties to the vectors and find the similarity and relatedness between them by measuring cousin similarity. After generating these candidate sets, we need to prune the one with the low similarity value um, by grouping the most similar ones to stay in the same group. Also, various uh, methods can be used for this grouping, such as clustering, community detection. Um, but our approach is agnostic, so any techniques can be applied on this approach. Um, and the next is query formulation, which rewrites the Sparky query to one with the union of similar triple patterns. Uh, but the important thing that we need to use minimal synonyms to return the maximum answer. And finally, the um, rewritten query is executed against the Sparkle endpoint to return the complete answer. And um, here is our, our research question. The first question should be answered is, if our approach can retrieve complete answer using expanded queries with minimal synonym predicates. And the second question is how the approach for detecting synonym predicates for query expansion can improve um, query answer completeness. And finally, how estimating the completeness in advance um, can help us to reduce the cost by avoiding unnecessary expanding queries. Um, as I said, our assumption is that incomplete community-based knowledge graph comprise synonym predicates that complement each other. Um, expanding query based on these synonym predicates can increase the answer completeness. 
So in order to answer research question one, the expansion query technique resorts to the RDF completeness model and a novel query writing technique to reformulate queries with minimal number of similar predicates. Also for answering the research question two, our approach um, exploits contextual knowledge during the identification of these synonyms. Uh, we have studied uh, frequent item set mining and as a baseline and also embedding knowledge graph techniques to discover these synonym predicates. In order to answer research question three, um, since query formulation is expensive and also do not always return the complete answer, by applying our deep completeness model in advance, we can ensure that whether the original query returns the complete answer. Um, and finally, we need to um, somehow estimate the accuracy and correctness of our approach and this um, rewriting query. For our evaluation, um, our benchmark is six different domains in the um, deep media knowledge graph, music, a sport person, drug, film, and history. And also we conducted our evaluation over um, 60 queries and for each domain we use 10 queries which do not return the complete result. And um, the average number of triple patterns in each original query is four. And the baseline that we use um, was a frequent item set mining technique, um, which for um, used for detecting synonyms. And also in this baseline, um, the assumption is that properties never occur together for the same subject, and um, which um, we didn't consider in our experiments because uh, community based knowledge graphs, um, many entities and the three pairs can be inserted by different scientists or from different data sources. So we didn't consider this assumption. Also, um, we compare our approach with three knowledge graph embedding techniques such as trans C, trans H, and RDF 2 way. And the metric that we used for assessing our approach was um, computing precision recall. And also we need to um, reduce the execution time as well. The initial experiment can be seen here, um, which compares our approach with the baseline and also these embedding techniques. Um, it showed that the, our approach is able to enhance the query completeness by detecting the synonym predicate efficiently. Um, also, the precision recall curve indicates that the proposed approach outperforms baseline and these embedding techniques. And for example, for a recall uh, from 0.3 to 0.8, um, we achieve very high precision. So this indicates that the answer retrieved from expanded query by detected synonym predicates are more similar to the answers retrieved from ideal graph. Um, however, the baseline also achieved highest precision at the beginning, um, but then drops to precision 0 0.05 because of too many false positives that we have in the baseline. Um, it means that there are a lot of predicates that are identified as synonym, but they're not synonym, such as nationality, source country, for example, they have um, different domains, so they cannot replace by each other. Also, in the baseline, they didn't provide any query answering method to show the completeness of the answer after expanding query with these synonyms. Um, we can observe here that um, rdf 2 vec performs trans D and trans H in identifying synonym predicates in a better way. So the result indicates that expanding query with minimal synonym predicates return maximal answer. And also we compare um, our approach with the ideal graph, the answer um, retrieved by the approach uh, and the answer retrieved by the ideal RDF graph. Um, for this, we needed to create the golden standard and compute the precision recall. Uh, precision indicates the intersection between correct answers retrieved from the ideal graph and the correct answer retrieved from expanded query divided to the ans number of answers retrieved by proposed approach. Um, all domains have high precision except in drug domain, and the reason can be found in the quality issue of drug data in the Wikipedia knowledge graph. And also we compute the recall in the same page as um, division 
is the number of answer retrieved from ideal graph. So the results show that answer retrieved from our approach is more similar to the answer retrieved from the ideal graph. Um, as an inclusion and the lesson that um, I learned, the community-based knowledge graph may suffer from incompleteness since the currently proposed completeness models do not consider similar and duplicated properties, enhancing query answer completeness with query expansion based on synonym predicates will be a solution to retrieve complete results. Um, also, the results show that the proposed approach outperforms the baseline and other embedding techniques that we studied. Um, in future, uh, we need to improve our approach by adding other components such as query decomposition, source selection, and query plan to enhance the um, completeness um, of our model in a more efficient way. Um, thanks for your attention. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, are there any questions, comments? Maybe I can ask a question if um, your approach is applicable also to the other knowledge graphs, not only to DBP, as you've shown it in your presentation. Is it the case? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, the next step is going to work, I mean, as a benchmark, having Wikidata. Um, but as I said, because it's agnostic, so we can use any um, knowledge graph which include the synonyms. So the thing that in Wikidata, we need to find a way that how we can discover the synonyms in terms of the, because of the structure is different from the Wikipedia. But as far as we have knowledge graph with um, synonym predicates, um, we can apply this approach. Thank, Thank you for the you. answer, because I also um, saw that in DBpedia, there are many, many uh, synonym relations, synonym predicates. However, maybe it will not be the case for uh, Wikidata, but yeah, mm -hmm. I maybe you can um, mention some other knowledge graphs that have the same uh, as mm -hmm. same problem as DBP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, for example, the other thing is like biomedical uh, domain knowledge graph also. Um, this is one um, use case that we want to use on it because also in terms of drugs, we have many synonyms in terms of, I don't know, like treatment. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I have questions. I have a question. Thank you very much for the representation. And uh, the problem is very interesting. You have to have to complete answer for a spark query. I have a question. How, how do you know that you have a complete answer? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what we did um, is based on the ideal RDF graph that we generated. So um, first, ideal RDF knowledge graph that we have has all the triples. So we have a query, and then based, we see if it can retrieve all the answers based on the RDF, RDF graph, then we say, okay, this is retrieves the complete answer. We don't need to expand it anymore. Um, but here in my case, I just use the queries which are um, which we know that they don't produce the complete answers. But um, the one, this RDF completeness model is based on the ideal RDF graph that we can see if the query will return the complete answer or not. And also by having, uh, by checking that if they have synonymous properties in knowledge graph or not. Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. Uh, I'm going to present to you today uh, personal knowledge graphs, use cases in e-learning platforms. I'm Eleni Ilku. I'm affiliated in the LKS Research Center in Leibniz University, Hanover. My supervisor is Professor Wolfgang Neidl and I'm supported by the ETN Nographs. You can find the preprint of the paper in the QR code on the bottom of uh, the slide here. So first of all, I'm going to be talking about a few things uh, today. The knowledge graphs, uh, the personal knowledge graphs, the e-learning use cases, uh, which I'm going to develop a little bit more, the collaborative search and the e-learning platform. 
So first of all, knowledge graphs are quietly well established and well known in this community. Um, we are mostly working with uh, DBpedia or Yago, for example. Now, what the personal knowledge graph might be uh, new to someone is basically um, a smaller graph. It's a user-centric graph with user-related uh, data that takes part that takes some parts from the bigger. Uh, knowledge graph, which might be an encyclopedic knowledge graph or a domain knowledge graph. And uh, we can think about it, for example, in a domain knowledge graph, in the uh, medical knowledge graph, that the personal knowledge graph could be the patient's uh, graph, the patient's data, basically. So now on the e-learning use cases, the collaborative search um, is a search activity that happens when two or more people team up to do an online search that can happen uh, either synchronously or asynchronously. And it can also be as a learning activity. And a learning platform, you can think about a self-tutoring platform like um, EDX or Coursera, for example. So now, what's the problem? The problem is that the encyclopedic knowledge graphs do not contain personal data by, by nature. So the lack of the ability to represent users' interest and all this personalization that is needed. And there is a need for personalization. And I argue here that uh, linked open data can help here as well as uh, all the semantic web technologies. And of course, in the subdomain I'm investigating more, the education, there's a push uh, for digital transformation, lifelong learning, and of course, during uh, the pandemic, all the education has been pushed online. However, right now it's lacking of this intelligence part somehow of uh, making things uh, smarter. They're just becoming digital, but not better somehow. So solution I can suggest here is the personal knowledge graphs. The personal knowledge graphs, I believe they can be applied in many different domains, not just uh, education or maybe medicine that are already uh, used. Uh, I believe maybe they can be applied to anything like uh, history, uh, mapping of different historians and what they have said and so on. So it's basically small and user-centric knowledge graphs and they're good for exploring user patterns, finding user information, and in my case as well, in collaborative features. So basically exploring these group patterns. Maybe I can share here an example. So in, if we have, for example, on the top, a Wikipedia knowledge graph, and we have different entities and facts, and we have different areas related to different things. For example, the pink one you see on the screen, it's related to mental health, and maybe we have another one that's related to bicycle. We can see three examples of personal knowledge graphs on the bottom, which are from three different users. Maybe one is, uh, maybe all of them are searching something related to a project, or um, they have teamed up for a, for an activity, uh, for a search activity online, and they have their own data there in the personal knowledge graph related to their profile, related to their activity. Uh, outside uh, offline, for example, and maybe they have also parts of the no of the bigger knowledge graph mapped to their personal knowledge graphs, but maybe not all of them, maybe only some areas, maybe uh, some extra things and so on. So the believe the research problem is really interesting. It goes to many different directions. There are some, here presented some research questions I'm, uh, I'm trying to tackle. First of all is uh, how to semantic, uh, syntactically and semantically represent a personal knowledge graph in the e-learning domain. And how can e-learning platforms offer better semantically enhanced personalized features? One of them could be the semantic recommendations, for example, with the usage of the personal knowledge graphs compared to what they do already. How can collaborative search learning environments offer more personalized uh, features with the usage of personal knowledge graphs and how can collaborative, can collaborative learning platforms offer better collaboration with the users of personal knowledge graphs? And these are the last two reflect, as I said before, to the user patterns and the group patterns as well, which can they be revealed from the users of personal knowledge graphs in the back end and not just a simple database. Regarding the state of the art, the personal knowledge graphs, um, it's a very new attempt, uh, something new in the semantic web community. They are trying to address the challenges raised from personal information management um, regarding uh, users uh, retrieving and managing their information. The initial efforts uh, so far are in the medical domain, as I mentioned before, representing patient's data over a medical knowledge graph. 
and there are some tries already uh, regarding personal knowledge graph uh, summarization uh, from uh, Taro Safavi, if I remember correct, and uh, the group uh, of uh, Danai Kutra, which are offering offline uh, smaller size knowledge graph summarizations. They offer some um, interesting views, if I can say, on what can happen on an on-device application. And uh, we are inspired by these works and uh, hoping to build upon them for our application, although they don't completely fit to the, the purpose of uh, the applications we have in e-learning uh, in mind. And um, now, regarding more towards the use cases, the personalization in e-learning basically means adaptive recommenders recommendations regarding the curriculum, the learning paths, the learning uh, preferences, the accessibility, which can mean either languages, as was mentioned before, can mean also regarding uh, uh, visual impairment or um, anything else, if we could say. Also the accessibility regarding users data. There are two main uh, approaches there, the symbolic and the sub-symbolic ones. The symbolic basically used ontologies or semantic frameworks, and sub-symbolic it's a kind of a black boxes. Uh, and uh, we're also inspired by the open learning model, which is present there, that we can have something uh, similar uh, in uh, the use case we are applying for the e-learning platform. And now collaborative search, as I mentioned before, can also happen as a learning activity. Uh, one of these domains is the searching as learning, is the SAL, as I have the acronym there. Uh, the main thing here from the works that are present is that they focus a lot on the entities, or they are entity-centric. And this is a really good thing for us because the personal knowledge graphs are taking uh, their information and facts from knowledge graphs, from basically entities online. So this is a really good thing that it's uh, coming as a natural complementary to all these works. A little bit about the approach now. So you can see, uh, this is a figure actually taken from the paper. It's an architecture for creating a personal knowledge graph for a user in the bucket of an e-learning system. That can be an e-learning system of general purpose, for example, going there and learning a new topic, a new skill, a new course, or it can be as well as a collaborative search as we were saying before. So the input stream is the user profile, the user activity, interests, and might be as well the user group. The, what happens there is the information collected from the user logs and from anything anywhere else, they are connected to the knowledge graphs available, maybe domain knowledge graph, if we're talking for education, um, maybe general purpose knowledge graphs like Wikipedia or Wikidata, and we perform there some name entity recognition. And with respect to some structure provided by an ontology, and of course the privacy, we're creating the personal knowledge graph. Then this personal knowledge graph is stored on the application, it's on site. To be shared something to the downstream application might be needing another filter as well. So the two cases here we have, it's the collaborative search developed in the LearnWeb platform, which is developed by uh, L3S Research Center and University in Hanover where I am affiliated at. Um, basically it's, um, uh, platform where you can anyone can log in for free, can create an account and log in for free. And it helps you just as you search for anything online, search there, but have your uh, group members activity together with yours. That helps you when you're collaborating in a project, uh, when you are uh, teaming up in a project to uh, share this information uh, with others and basically keep track of what it's in one of us, uh, if we're all in a project is doing and uh, what's next to be found. This is also where we are investigating on enhancing the collaboration with the personal knowledge graphs as well. And the other platform um, I'm suggesting for this implementation is the eDoer platform, which is a prototype uh, developed by TAB uh, in Leibniz University Hanover again which uh, is linking skills, topics, and educational content with different learning goals. Uh, you can find theory, YouTube videos, tests there, and uh, basically it's a, like a self-tutoring system. We can utilize, in the second case, the knowledge base of uh, the e doer and uh, have these uh, semantically enhanced features uh, through the personal knowledge graphs being mapped there. It's uh, another thing that can happen also there is um, 
keeping track of the learning path of the user on the personal knowledge graph. That's also something really interesting for um, educational perspective, because usually you want to keep track of what people have already learned, what have they accomplished. Maybe that would help us on in an investigating um, gaps in their knowledge. And that's not usually possible to be done uh, directly on the knowledge base of a system or just a simple um, user's profile. So personal knowledge graphs can help as well. Then there are a lot of opportunities and challenges. Um, uh, personal knowledge graphs are promising new in, in this domain and the problems that they're trying to address have not been uh, tried to be solved with the usage of the semantic technologies or uh, not via um, this method that we are suggesting because it's not just um, a new technology, it's also utilizing um, many benefits from different uh, domains, if we can say. However, there are some challenges regarding to privacy. Of course, we're talking about user's data. Uh, maybe we're talking also about group, group's data. There are a lot of layers there that need to be taken into account and we need to raise privacy as a first class citizen. And another thing is that the data we have are time dependent. Maybe right now, this semester, I'm uh, working on something, but next semester, I'm really interested in something else. This, um, my personal knowledge graph on its platform, it needs somehow to be adapted to this time need of okay, maybe I, I, I was really interested in something, but now I'm doing something else. This needs to be updated on time. And um, this is something uh, challenging for us and we're really digging into it. Regarding the methodology, it would be both uh, qualitative and quantitative. We're planning on uh, recruiting human participants, um, experts and non-experts, um, uh, both technical and non-technical people, um, and, and interviewing them and asking uh, and having some questionnaires. There are also some limitations there because uh, regarding the quant uh, quantitative uh, part, it's that there are no gold standards or baseline metrics for collaborative search and searching as learning. However, what we are uh, thinking of doing is based on the downstream application we have in mind because the personal knowledge graphs is basically the backend and they can, sub they can support many different applications. So based on the application we have in mind, we can adapt um, some state of the art to this setting, to a collaborative setting or to a self-tutoring setting and have them compared. The results we have so far, you can see on your screen the user profile pattern from the Educorontology, which we published uh, last year in ISWC resource track. The um, Educorontology is an educational career oriented recommendation ontology that uh, provides um, the background, the basis for uh, and uh, e-learning uh, platform for having uh, personalized recommendations. And uh, here we see the part which is more interesting for us, the user profile, which you can find in the middle, is really, of course connected to the user and user logs, but also some other parameters are playing a big role there, the psychological parameters, the academic parameters, the learning preferences. They're also creating the learning path. They're related to recommendation and with respect, of course, to accessibility which accessibility here can also contain the privacy. And another thing that we have submitted and still waiting for the review to come uh, is the collab graph, which is a visualization of uh, the group uh, search activity in a summary graph. You can see on the left, this is the bar chart of whether the green stars uh, strongly agree or somewhat agree, neither agree or disagree, somewhat disagree or disagree, the bottom ones. Uh, in the questions of we got from the users general feedback regarding whether they like the group results visualized in the graph, the summary of the team members results, the graph visualizations, whether they like the graph visualizations next to the list view of the search results, which is the classical view a search engine is offering, and whether they like the combination of the list and the graph view. We also found some interesting uh, results there related to um, open projects and closed end projects to many number of participants, a small number of participants. And um, it's um, still under review, but we hope uh, it will go well and uh, we can build it up on this work. Regarding the future work now, of course, uh, there are, I think, two pillars to investigate it here. One is related to 
personal knowledge graph score, which has to do related to knowledge acquisition, the maintaining, the creation, the update factors of personal knowledge graphs, as I mentioned before, they're mainly very much time dependent, as well as the privacy, which uh, this fact we foresee maybe as a collaboration with a, a legal uh, researcher. And then regarding the e-learning applications, uh, there can be semantic personalized recommendations, both in the collaborative search as well as the e-learning general uh, purpose platform. There can be annotations from tutors and teachers and direct feedback that can enhance the learning. And uh, there can be potential knowledge building spaces. Just to conclude, Personal knowledge graphs um, seem very promising. They are small and centric knowledge, uh, user centric knowledge graphs in the platform, which they contain uh, facts from the bigger knowledge graphs, but as well as users' data and users' interests and user activity. There are applications uh, in the knowledge graph in the educational uh, domain that are, I'm suggesting the collaborative search and e learning platforms. There are benefits for the e learning platforms, which are connected to uh, knowledge bases. And there are promises for better personalization and collaboration as well. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or reach me via my email. You can also find the preprint via this QR code. And let me quickly also mention the references here I used and come back to the slide. And as a question, Sorry, can you repeat? Oh, sorry, we have a connection issue. Uh, okay, are there any questions, comments? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, this is very uh, exciting work. Uh, how would this uh, be perhaps associated with a federated learning where uh, if you treat each individual, you know, personalized uh, uh, or personal uh, knowledge graph as one uh, site, and then uh, can you actually make sure your global knowledge graph be consistent uh, because each site may have different type of data, uh, how can you make sure that the global site can be consistent in, 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 in this context? So if I understand correct, it's regarding more the consistency of encyclopedic or domain knowledge graphs rather than the personal knowledge graphs, am I correct? Yeah, I, I, I guess you could, uh, we could use a federated learning, right? So to integrate multiple sites, uh, knowledge graph. I'm just saying that can this be done um, in, in your context? Because right now your personal knowledge graph may not have interaction with the others. Is that right? Basically, yes. It's not like pushing changes to the knowledge graph, if that's right. the question. Yes. Yes. But what if there, there could be? I think, first of all, we need a lot of data to get there. Like we need mm -hmm. something that can be um, verified from many different users that this connection of this entity makes sense with this connection of this entity that does not exist, for example, on the knowledge graph, yep. and then have it uh, populated. But I really believe personal knowledge graphs are having a lot of potential because they can be applied in many different domains in my perspective. What you're saying there, it can be also applied for general knowledge, for example, as I mentioned yes. before. The, yeah, the yes, example with yes, the historians, yes. it can be that you maybe identify their biases or you identify uh, events that have been or have happened differently from what we expect based on these connections, because you can really find the, these patterns from yeah, different but, users. But somehow the, the, the problem with the knowledge graph is that it is a, it's just a type of representation. So the way that I represent thing and the way that you represent thing might be totally different. And how do we actually make sure that they are consistent knowledge? That's all. I think that's a bit further from my topic. But okay. what, what I can suggest for the personal knowledge graphs is, for example, if we're using many different knowledge graphs for this personal knowledge graph to be created, um, 
if we are gathering data from different sources and then we can observe if something may like as I, again, as I said, like if there's a big study and we have, for example, a thousand users searching all the same topic, mm -hmm. then we can find if we have it, this study over different knowledge graphs, which connections should be there based on statistics in a sense that mm. are not present in everything. Maybe there are connections there in uh, Wiki, Wikidata and Jago, yeah. but they're not in Wikipedia. So then you can suggest something. But I guess this, this is also an issue, an issue, a challenge I have in this uh, study because it's very much human dependent. We need human participants to do yeah. all these things. It's, it's not something machine oriented that much because you need the human on the loop. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I, I didn't even turn on my video, sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your question. Interesting work, very good. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation. I have a question related to the uh, personal knowledge graph. You, in the use case, you keep about e-learning platform uh, in general about personal knowledge graph. Where the data are hosted? Data hosted locally or in remote? Or this is special with privacy. Problem with privacy. Yeah. That's true. Privacy is a really big concern. And uh, so far, especially in the collaborative search, we're foreseeing it in two different layers. One is then the user layer, where the information I have should part of it be shared with my group and only very small part of that be shared publicly. And then we have the group privacy where you can see some of the user activity of the team members, but not everything. Um, now, regarding the storing part, the personal knowledge graphs so far are in the platform. So in the eLearnWare platform and the eDoware platform, as I mentioned before. There are thoughts of um, maybe having them extended in the future and have them more publicly available. Uh, also maybe working with um, anonymizing techniques to have this data as somehow benchmarks or whatever else in the future. But so far, there's just there's a, a backbone for supporting these uh, applications. And yeah, pl please. <laughs> are, you, are you aware with the solid project? Yes, I am. And it's very much aligned. However, it's a different perspective because uh, the personal knowledge graphs is basically in the platform where the user is using it. And the, I as far as I understand the solid is user creating uh, a pod which the platform is having access to. So it's a bit different perspective, but it's really close the perspective the, of the change towards it, I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sayed, uh, and I'm a PhD student at Heriot University Semantic Web Lab. Uh, this is now more than two years I'm working on the quality of Wikidata references. And my goal is to make um, the maximum use of automated technologies in evaluating and improving the quality of Wikidata references. Uh, to explain my journey so far, I'll start with briefly introducing uh, Wikidata. I move on then to the problem of reference quality. I then explain two uh, sub projects uh, we've done last year, uh, facilitating our work. Uh, then I explain our reference quality scoring framework, which is the main part of my research. And finally, I wrap up with the lessons learned and the goals. Uh, okay, uh, as we already know, uh, Wikidata is one of the biggest knowledge graphs in the linked data cloud. Uh, it's open for editing to anyone who wants to contribute. Uh, the unique feature of Wikidata is that you can mention the source of every single claim by uh, something that is called reference. Uh, right now, near 70% of all claims in Wikidata have got references. Uh, here we, we can see an example of uh, three references in Wikidata for the sex or gender claim of Albert Einstein. Uh, so the first reference points to an English Wikipedia article. The second reference is pointing to an external source. The third reference is pointing specifically to the source of the fact on the web. Uh, and um, some, it is called an external URI. Uh, but why references and thereafter the quality of references should be important uh, because the trust to the data is important. Almost all search engines uh, are using knowledge graphs like Wikidata right now. Uh, what they obviously don't want uh, their users see is a wrong flight ticket or a wrong uh, shopping price from an untrusted source. Uh, or for people uh, who developing medical platforms, obviously they prefer access to the most 
reputable and verifiable rule sets. Uh, this is the same situation for AI applications like assistant softwares and recommendation systems. You know, all of these applications are using knowledge graphs. All of them need to access trustable data. And the best way to judge about the trustworthiness of data is by referencing and mentioning the provenance. So references are important. Uh, let's see now what caught our attention about the quality of uh, references. Uh, in the first place, we found that many studies have been done on the quality of linked data, but almost there, are, there, is, there is not any direct comprehensive study on, on the quality of the references themselves in the field. I can say there are just three studies uh, that specifically address the quality of references in Wikidata, which you can see here. The first two are based on Wikidata policies. The second one is actually uh, the newer version of the first study using the recent Wikidata dump. Uh, the third one is a simple proposal and hasn't got any plan to, to how we can evaluate the quality of references. Uh, so we came up with the most important question, how we can effectively say a reference or, or a bunch of references are good for use or not. Uh, in other words, how we can measure the quality of references by numbers. Uh, we also were interested in other questions, for example, what is the difference between the quality of human added versus bot added references? We also would like to know how the quality of Wikidata references changed in recent years, because the size of Wikidata uh, increased dramatically more than 10 times during these years. Uh, well, uh, we started working on Wikidata. The two main problems we faced uh, at the first time were first, the large size of Wikidata, and second, uh, no other KG supports referencing like Wikidata. So Wikidata was unique. Uh, so we needed a way to split Wikidata into smaller parts so that we could run the experiments on available hardware and also compare the results between different subsets. Uh, the tool we are using for subsetting is WDumper. The tool is based on Wikidata Toolkit Java library. With WDumper, we can create topical subsets, uh, I mean, a subset of Wikidata that is around a specific topic, as well as random subsets. Uh, we did an evaluation on the tool, which is published in uh, 2021. And in the next step, we try to perform a basic statistical investigation to better understand the structure of references in Wikidata. So we used WDumper tool and we extracted, we extracted six Wikidata wiki projects, uh, which are GeneWiki, Astronomy, Taxonomy, Music, Law, and Chips. And in these subjects, we investigated references uh, statistically. Uh, we, we extracted some basic statistics like which subset has the most references and referencing rate. Um, we found also what type of properties are used in references more. Um, we also got familiar with this a concept of uh, which calls reference sharing, which is which occurs when a, a single reference is shared between lots of uh, statements. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to the main part of my research, which is developing the assessment framework. So uh, after those research, as we know, you know, we try to develop our own framework for comparing the quality. As we know, quality is a fitness for you. So quality is a multidimensional concept. Each dimension has some quality criteria or uh, quality metrics in which the fitness of data can be measured. Uh, dimensions themselves are categorized in usually five or six major categories. Uh, here is the Zavari et al. classification, for example. Uh, so referencing quality assessment framework, which I'm saying, would be also a collection of quality metrics in the context of references. Uh, so there are two main sources of metrics in linked data, data quality literature, and uh, also reference specific definitions. Uh, from the first source, we recognize all data quality metrics in all dimensions, and we try to redefine them in the context of references, specifically for references. Uh, the second source is also reference specific definitions like what we discuss in our statistical paper or Wikidata policies uh, for internal so for external sources, for example. If we want to see what dimensions of data quality can be redefined in the context of references, I can say uh, from the 23 dimensions in Zavri at all, only two of them are not applicable to references. Uh, the rest of dimensions are applicable to the references and we'll take a quick look at them. 
So as a research project, we defined some tasks. Uh, we first gathered all data quality criteria from the main papers. We then reviewed all metrics to see what those are measuring. After that, we redefined the metrics formally in the context of references. Uh, to have an automatic, automated reference tool, reference assessment tool, uh, we then implement all defined metrics in Python and establish unit tests to ensure the proper functioning of the tool. And at the end, we apply the framework on big Wikidata subsets to analyze the results and polish the framework. So after the three steps, uh, we now have uh, 42 metrics formally defined in the context of references, and we cover 21 by data quality dimensions and also all six major categories uh, of the dimensions. So I try to mention some of the important metrics briefly. So for example, in the accessibility dimension, we try to answer how many reference URLs in Wikidata are resolved, or how many reference URLs uh, supports secure SSL or TLS connections, or how many references have got a license. Um, in the intrinsic category, which includes all metrics that are independent of user context, for example, uh, we measure how many references are bound to the valid domains and valid rooms, uh, or which or to which which extent uh, the RDF syntax uh, is correct between the references in itself. In the trust category, uh, in the context of references, we want to know um, are external sources, for example, are in a blacklist domain providers is what is their page rank, or we may want to judge them based on the type, like like you know um, the, a, a reference uh, would be a blog post or it might be a scholarly article or and so on. We also may want to look at how many references are added by bots or how many by humans. Uh, another thing would be the existence of more than one reference to a claim. So in Wikidata, you can add multiple references to a claim. When a claim has more than one reference, the referencing would be more trustable, for example. Uh, in the timeliness category, we consider versions of references. Uh, so we aim to answer two main questions. How, how much reference repels and external sources are fresh? And we want to know also how, many, how much external sources should be uh, fresh based on their uh, tags. Uh, in the contextual category, uh, we look for the completeness of references, questions like uh, do references have necessary triples and properties? We also look at the amount of data literally, I mean, the number of reference nodes, number of reference triples, and so on. And also a very important dimension, which is also in, is a, is, is, which is a, a Wikidata requirement that would be uh, relevancy, which aims to answer are provided references are relevant to the facts or not. And uh, finally, in the representational category, we score the data set based on better understandability and better interpretability. For example, the existence of blank nodes uh, is, is a negative point because uh, machines cannot interpret uh, blank nodes very well. Or having multilingual labels and descriptions is a very positive score. And uh, uh, and in the end, I would be discussing the situation and the uh, goals. So currently, I'm implementing, as I said, uh, the defined metrics in Python to have automated, uh, automated scripts. Um, I think more than 70% of metrics are now uh, implemented to ensure the implementation, the implementation works correctly uh, before the main experiments I'm using Python unit tests and also doing some quick checks on small Wikidata subsets to be to, to be sure that uh, the framework software is working properly. And uh, after finishing the implementation, uh, the next step would be running the framework on the actual data, which are Wikidata topical and random subsets. So we already prepared three topical subsets and three random subsets. Uh, we try to consider big enough subsets that reflect an overview of the entire Wikidata dump, uh, and also consider them small as, as small enough so we can perform on our hardware resources. Uh, after getting the results, uh, we try to polish framework, removing unnecessary metrics, uh, create a waiting system, maybe a user interface in which users could use the system based on their desire and their rates. Uh, and uh, finally, I'd like to point out to the most important research challenges and lessons 
lessons that we, that we learned from them so far. So the first challenge was, and still is, the huge size of Wikidata. You know, the size of Wikidata motivates, motivated us to work on Wikidata subsets together with uh, Shex community group from W3C. And now subsetting is going to be used more and more in uh, knowledge drop researches. Another challenge is formal definitions. So defining quality metrics formally is, is a very hard task. You know, the, the definitions and notions of metrics are different uh, among linked data professionals and uh, experts. But it would be even worse when we consider subjective concepts like uh, relevancy, you know, judging that a reference is relevant to a fact is not something straightforward. It would be even hard to uh, define such a uh, concept. And uh, we also have a very high demand for a system uh, that can give us fast access to Wikidata uh, edit history or, or Wikidata revisions history. So it is very important for investigating human and added human and bot activities or for investigating the timeliness. Currently, we are parsing HTML pace, uh, the history HTML pace of Wikidata items, which is not a good way. Uh, the history dump is uh, far bigger than Wikidata itself, so we cannot use it locally. So we need a, somehow a data set or, and with a public endpoints to query uh, Wikidata history. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if I'm out of my time now, but so please let me know your questions uh, and comments. Thank you very much. Um, can, I switch? can I switch off the mic? I have to... mm -hmm. switch off the mic. Let me switch. Off. off. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, we're just in the same room and there are like problems with microphones. Um, no, the timing was perfect. And I'm wondering, um, the, the topic looks very exciting to me. Um, but of course, like looking at this, uh, like large amount of metrics you analyze and um, I was wondering, because of course you can technically compute and apply them to reference and also technically compute many of them, probably even if it's like a challenge in scalability to do it on these uh, large data sets. But um, what do you think is, um, do you observe any patterns like which metrics could be more useful from the user perspective or from some um, kind of application perspective because in principle quality is defined as fitness for use and um, if we think about what applications might be really interested in or what real users might be really interested in if you now compute results of 20, uh, 42 metrics and present them so how do we actually can we say that uh, yeah, some some data is better than the other based on this or some more useful so what do, do you have you seen any metrics which make uh, intuitively sense or what do you think which metrics are the most important ones uh, yeah, so uh, when uh, I was defining the, the metrics, I try to be as comprehensive as possible and try to redefine everything that I can. So uh, the, the goal was that in the implementation phase and in the anal uh, analyzing phase, we will see which metrics uh, are more useful and which metrics are not uh, giving us very useful and uh, valuable information about the quality of references in Wikidata. So um, from my perspective so far, because I, I need to show the results to more than uh, two or three pe people to decide which uh, metric is more useful. But from my side, I think completeness uh, metrics, the metrics that are about the completeness of data, also the representational data uh, metrics, which are about the multilingual uh, labels or uh, in, interpreting the data with machines would be more important. Uh, and also uh, the, the trust uh, category, because uh, you know defining trust for references would be hard because references are a way to measure the trust. So measuring trust for references would be measuring trust for trust. And uh, I think that, that that is more challenging and would uh, give us uh, more valuable information about the references. So trust, completeness, and representational, I think those would be the main metrics in the final situation of my framework. Thank you. 
-hmm. And um, do you plan any kind of user study to maybe see which uh, references are more useful? Or, because it would be good to also have some more probably use, user feedback on them or have some statistics how often they are clicked actually to, that you can see if it correlates with any of those metrics. Uh, yeah, I didn't have such a uh, feedback so far. I didn't publish the results of uh, current, uh, current, current current studies because uh, I'm just recently finished uh, implementing the metrics. So um, I think I will publish the, the results as, as soon as possible in, in, in a journal, so we can say. Yeah, I mean, I, what I mean is more like a user study, right? To show the references to the users and to see uh, if they, judge these references you mean, you mean for example by questionnaires and something like yeah maybe questionnaire or maybe just um, yeah some um, collections and judgments uh, on on the metrics yeah. like not, not so, just automatically computing them but also asking for user yeah. feedback on this yeah that would be um, very important and necessary in uh, measuring subjective metrics like relevancy but currently i'm just focusing on objective metrics that i can uh, create a formal definition and run wrote an algorithm and write an S script to measure them by machines uh, but if we go ahead and see we can uh, implement some subjective metrics like relevancy we will need user direct user opinions about references so we can use a machine learning algorithm like what Amaral et al and Piscopo et al did mm -hmm. before yeah, and maybe I mean, if you have that, it would be also interesting to see if there is any correlation between these metrics, right? So if you see that some um, user relevance, for example, correlates with any of the metrics, you can automatically compute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also some concepts would be repeating in many metrics, somewhere in positive uh, scores, somewhere in negative scores. For example, reference sharing would be a positive point in conciseness because it's reduced the size of data and redundancy in data. But this sharing, reference sharing would be very bad in relevancy because you just share a reference between lots of statements and these statements would be, should be relevant to all of them. So you are treating the relevancy condition. Uh, so yeah, there are very interesting relations between metrics and concepts in metrics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions, comments? No, it doesn't seem to be the case. So then I um, like maybe to... one comment from me uh, yes. to the presenter. Um, maybe are you aware of the Wikidata Complete tool? Uh, sorry, which tool? I, I didn't. Hear you. Uh, Wikidata Complete. No, no. I didn't hear about it. Yeah, maybe I can provide you the link and uh, thank you, you very can, much. Yeah. yeah, check this one because it what it does is actually um, search for the um, for the um, information in the unstructured data and proposes new relations um, with the evidence from the actual source to which okay. Maybe so, it would be interesting to your research also. Yeah, that would be very good. So if it's suggesting references to users about items it would be very important to evaluate the output of such a suggestion tool in order to see what's the differences between yeah humans. so i just yeah, pasted the you. link to the chat thank you very much yes we can welcome to the uh, spark calculus session in the phd symposium uh, in this session we have uh, we have keynote and uh, two presentation the keynote is uh, given by Angela Bonifatio. I'm happy to introduce Angela Bonifatio. She is a professor of computer science at Lyon 1 University. And she leads the database group at uh, uh, Liris uh, Senaris Research Laboratory. She, her main, uh, her current research uh, interests are on interplay between relational and graph-oriented data paradigm. Especially, she works on query processing, data integration, learning for both structural and structural data model. She is involved in many uh, research grants, and she is uh, very, very. She she wrote more than one hundred fifty publication in the in top venues of uh, database data management. 
she 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 published in main conference a uh, same sigma the PLDB or, or this uh, high 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 ranking uh, conference, and she is uh, she will be the she will be the um, uh, she will be the program chair of ACM Sigma in 2022. So welcome, Angela, and you can start your talk. Thank you, Ala. Thank you for the nice introduction. And welcome to my talk on query-driven graph processing. So I can skip the first slide. Let's go to uh, directly to uh, the motivation why graphs are used. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we can observe that graphs are a common data model that is used everywhere, um, and um, uh, it it allows to uh, actually inspect the data, but also to create uh, uh, connections between the data and then to. Uh, um, derive insights and knowledge from the data and produce wisdom. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, tech driving applications of graphs because graphs they combine uh, data science with uh, multi op relationships, and they are adopted uh, uh, in many 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 domains. Uh, not in all the domains, but we hope that this uh, will grow in the next few years. So uh, these are the graphs are unifying abstractions, as I said, that can uh, help us, you know, uh, uh, encode uh, real world and digital world phenomena. Uh, there was a nice survey in a VLDB journal uh, by some colleagues at the University of Waterloo, uh, where they uh, actually interviewed uh, many um, uh, vendors and um, uh, end users of graphs in, in uh, tech companies. And um, uh, they could enumerate 18 domains in which graphs are used, including uh, so digital domain, but also real world domain, such as uh, uh, logistic and planning, chemistry, biology, uh, finance, social sciences, and so on. So uh, even though graphs are used uh, um, in many domains, um, in the future, uh, the data models, the query languages and system requirements uh, underlying graphs will be uh, evolving. So how do we cope with this evolution? This is one of the questions that I try to solve in my talk. So uh, there is no one killer application for graphs, but uh, one uh, application that uh, uh, might be uh, interesting for you is the um, Graphs for Good initiative driven by Neo4j, uh, one of the most popular graph database uh, company. So they created this covidgraph.org uh, that collects uh, data from several data sources during the pandemic. So it collects data about uh, patents, publications, uh, but also uh, uh, biomedical data. Uh, and uh, experimental data about uh, the use of vaccines and the use of uh, um, medications against COVID. Uh, and also data about uh, indicators about the spread of the virus. So um, this graph is of course evolving over time uh, and it's a good example of uh, how uh, graphs uh, can be used in, uh, in uh, uh, applications that serve uh, human beings. Uh, of course, the use of graph is not uh, uh, only recent because it started uh, a long time ago. And uh, for instance, we are in the web conference and the first uh, usage of graph processing actually, uh, um, you know, more in a distributed fashion was actually Google PageRank, which was at the beginning uh, relying on a map reduce paradigm. And then it shifted to this uh, uh, more like partitioned uh, partitioning-based computation, uh, like a think like a vertex kind of computation. Um, and then other systems, especially systems that need to do like, um, um, or, uh, they, they need to, to cope with the streaming data, such as Facebook, for instance, uh, they use a different paradigm, which is not task-based but it's more like, um, uh, is, is, is more task-based than distributed, yeah? And this is an example is uh, Facebook, for instance, and Apache Giraffe. Uh, as I was saying, there are a lot of graph databases right now in this uh, um, 
uh, plot, you can see the, their growing popularity. And of course, they have been uh, uh, proposed by companies, by several companies, some of them that are very innovative in the, in the, in the, last, uh, in the last decade. Um, and there are a, a lot of them, and uh, this is a ranking of graph DBMS, uh, not even the most recent one, and of course you could accept, access the most recent on the web. Uh, but here you can see really that the lines become cluttered, so it means that there are more and more that are becoming popular. Even though there are a lot of graph databases uh, and there are a lot of uh, graph query languages and graph data models so that we can adopt, then we, we are going to face the problem of expressiveness, yeah? Uh, of course, the expressiveness that, uh, that you are going to choose depends on what is your application and uh, how you as a human conceptualize graphs. Yeah? You will adopt one or the other data model, one or the other query language, so you will uh, probably um, have an idea of what you need based on your application. Um, but even if this is the case, then you need to cope with interoperability issues because you have da several data sources to, uh, that are heterogeneous and you will have to integrate them in one graph. So we thought about uh, this idea of different data models as a, a way to cope with this is to build a lattice of data models. And to use this lattice, I will show you an example to actually uh, uh, try to find a trade-off between understandability of the data model and their expressive power. And similarly to data model in query languages, we need something similar, which is not a lattice, but is some kind of logic or algebra based uh, framework that let us, uh, you know, uh, kind of having a yardstick to uh, actually compare these different uh, graph query languages and different graph workloads. So, but let's start from the very beginning. I mentioned the different data models. Let's pick one, let's pick the property graph. And here you, you find an example of, a, well, a, a tiny example of a property graph in which we have uh, nodes uh, that represent persons who are experts and then are, um, they can be apprentices or novices and they know each other, like it's a, a professional network, they, they work for each other. And here you can see that uh, this, um, nodes and the edges so they are labeled they might have also multiple labels yeah uh, because it's a multi-graph and, and then attached to each node or to each edge you might have properties that are these key value pairs for instance the salary of these persons or the year in which they have uh, they have been uh, uh, they have met so if we want to give a formal definition so a property graph is a pair of uh, nodes node sets and edge sets yeah that are both finite set of objects and then we have uh, um, uh, an, an assignment uh, so we have a function uh, eta that assigns to each edge the source and target nodes and we have a labeling function lambda that assigns to uh, uh, vertices or edges uh, uh, a finite set of labels yeah and then we have the last function which is a, a partial function no, that assigns uh, to uh, vertices or edges a pair of, uh, of uh, key, value, key value pairs, yeah? So these are the properties. So how would this lattice of data models that I was um, introducing look like? Well, there are a lot of data models. So from here is an example of lattice. Uh, of course, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean to be complete or comprehensive, but it's one example. Uh, that we gave in the paper. So at the bottom, we find very simple incarnations of graphs, like simple graphs or directed graphs. These are mathematical concepts that exist since a long time. And at the top, we find uh, graph data models that are very, very well known and uh, widely used, such as RDF for the WWW consortium, and then uh, for the property graphs, yeah, the latest versions of the standard version of the property graph, which is the ongoing standardization initiative, yeah. Um, so usually uh, we, with this lattice, we would like to make these different data models interoperable, but how do we do this? We will have to introduce uh, uh, direct translations from one data model to another data model or to introduce mappings uh, that are uh, abstractions of uh, the differences between the data models. So 
One way to um, understand the different data model is to propose for each graph instance um, uh, what we call a summary uh, of, of the graph instance. So you, you, can, uh, uh, you can see it visually in this picture. So this picture on, on, the, on your uh, left hand side, you can see the uh, linked data benchmark uh, uh, council uh, uh, benchmark, uh, which is uh, 5K uh, nodes. Uh, and you can see it's very cluttered. And then we extract the summary. So uh, the summary is a quotient summary in which we are going to count the frequency of labels. And as you can see the, on the right hand side, um, you can see that uh, uh, there are uh, these big nodes and these account for the most occurring nodes in the graph. So if we use a summary, then we are, we are trying to in, um, um, you know, facilitate the understandability yeah, of the data models. Of course, uh, this is done, in our case, is done to, uh, so we are counting the frequency of labels and we are trying to address uh, uh, queries that are uh, counting aggregates uh, plus um, um, complex reachability. Uh, I will come to this uh, uh, kind of queries. I will come back to this kind of queries later in my talk. Uh, for now, uh, uh, just to, uh, to give an idea, um, this problem of minimizing the number of nodes in the summary and maximize connectivity is NP complete. And in our work, we derived an heuristics to produce this summary that can be used then to uh, answer queries in a in approximate fashion, yeah? So to do what is called approximate query processing. There are a lot of usages of graph summarization. There is a nice survey in ACM computing surveys uh, that I'm, uh, I'm citing in this slide in which uh, they have uh, um, summarized the, the, the kind of networks that uh, for which summaries have been defined, so static or dynamic, and the different kind of methods that you can use. Uh, I will not spend a lot of time on this, but here you can see that uh, summarization is a common topic in many, many fields. So not only databases, but also graph clustering, machine le graph machine learning, community detection, and so on. And there is a lot of work on static graphs, but very few works have addressed the case of dynamic graphs. Okay, let's go back to um, queries because uh, the title of my talk is query driven uh, graph processing so queries are an important ingredients yeah, uh, of, um, of graph processing. So we start from the very beginning so uh, uh, in all, all kind of query languages they define these graph patterns yeah. And if uh, the semantics of these graph query languages, they, they, it, uh, it boils down to non-recursive data log with, the, with the negation, yeah? Uh, is, is non-recursive, yeah? So is the, the best part of data log, yeah? Or is a weakly recursive, yeah? Because there is this, uh, this um, a clean star, we will see it in a, in a, in a few moments. Um, there are a lot of uh, several concrete query languages so OpenCypher for Neo4j, Oracle PGQL, but also if you use RDF, you will, uh, you will find SparkQL, and this is a SparkQL session. Um, and there are also standards that are being uh, defined. Uh, what is important is that um, there, are a, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, graph fragments, uh, graph query language fragments that we, we want to consider. Let me give you an example. So if we start from very simple queries, we will have these basic graph patterns yeah, uh, that have been defined by, by the, 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 the semantic web community. In our, in our community, we call them uh, conjunctive queries. Yeah? I give you two examples here and uh, uh, you know, no, not by chance I, I express them in a kind of uh, data log like language, but then you can express them in whatever graph query language you like, which is SparkQL or uh, GQL uh, or, uh, or OpenCypher and so on. So uh, uh, the first query Q1 just computes the, uh, the persons, so the apprentices that works for an expert, uh, for two experts, yeah. And um, it's a very, very, it's a basic graph pattern. The query Q2 on, on, the, le on the right hand side is a cyclic query in which we are going to compute this uh, uh, three, three uh, triples uh, in which we have uh, uh, novice apprentices and experts that know each other. Yeah. 
At the bottom, you will find more increasingly complex uh, queries in which we have introduced the recursion. Yeah? So what we call conjunctive regular path queries yeah? and uh, the regular uh, path is, uh, is given in my example by the clean plus. Yeah? So what we are computing here is the pairs of novice and experts yeah? uh, such that uh, a novice knows with a plus, yeah? so at uh, an arbitrary um, uh, and pass on, on arbitrary length on the graph, uh, an, an apprentice, uh, and the apprentice works for uh, the expert. The expert is self-employed. You can notice the self-loop. And then uh, there are two apprentices that are uh, uh, retrieved in this query, A1 and A2. And in the second case of A2, we will not use recursion. Yeah? So as you can see, this query has still conjunctions, yeah. So co conjunctive is a conjunctive query, but in, in uh, moreover, it also has a, um, a recursion, yeah. This uh, uh, the clean clean plus. So in our book, we have also worked on the uh, proposal for algebra for gra complex graph queries. So the conjunctive regular path queries plus unions, and we define operators for this algebra. And these operators, uh, they, 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 are, they are similar to uh, relational operators, but more in, in addition, we also, have, uh, we also have the clean star, yeah? Um, here is an example of a more complex queries. So we want to uh, 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 retrieve uh, the, the known experts, the experts that have known each other uh, since year 2000, and these experts uh, have a salary uh, less than 5K. And uh, they also know other persons who are related by uh, working, uh, working uh, uh, relationship or friendship relationship uh, uh, at, any, at any length. Yeah? You, you can notice the related star yeah? with the clean star uh, to, to another person whose salary is uh, lower than their salary. Yeah? So the idea of this um, uh, presentation, uh, particular uh, the part of the presentation, is that logic and algebra, uh, together with the algebra, can help us um, uh, understanding uh, the different data models and the different query languages, but also can help, help, does, help uh, us drive uh, this uh, interplay between uh, uh, graph data management and other fields, such as, for instance, uh, statistical learning and symbolic learning. Because if we use uh, a logic, then we can use um, ontological reasoning, for instance. But then we can also, um, if we use uh, uh, statistical methods, for instance, we use embeddings, graph embeddings or graphlets, then how do we are going, how we are going to use this in the, in the query processing? In, in, uh, in the algebraic operators, yeah. So this is, uh, this is some, uh, some topic that uh, requires a lot of investigation, has not been done yet, but is very interesting for future work. So one question that I want you to uh, focus on is about real world queries, yeah. In, um, in uh, our, uh, our previous work, we focused on this analysis of real, uh, massive real world query logs that are uh, uh, query logs that um, uh, are very well known in, uh, um, uh, they are open source, yeah, in RDF, uh, SparkQL endpoints, such as Wikidata, for instance, yeah, this is uh, the Wikidata lesson, the Wikidata example. Um, as you can see here, we measured the size of these queries, and we measured the size by considering also those queries that are more complex that I was showing you, so the regular path queries, yeah? So we consider the path expressions or the property paths in the computation of the lengths. So darker colors here indicate that uh, the queries are larger, they have more uh, triples, yeah? Uh, so as you can see, we can notice that there is a difference between um, robotic queries and organic queries. So organic queries are formulated by the users. Robotic queries, they are uh, uh, queries uh, that, uh, that are uh, predefined in the API. And you can see that um, uh, the queries that um, are uh, organic, they, are, uh, they, they, are, uh, in, they have more um, higher um, la large sizes than the queries that are robotic and valid, okay, which is the first, uh, the first part of the histogram. 
And uh, the queries that are timed out, TO, the timed out, so the queries that in the, in the logs uh, uh, didn't finish their execution, also they have higher size. So this is uh, for us inspiring because it means that size is one important uh, characteristic of the query that we should investigate in our research. So here I want to show you the characteristics of these recursive queries, yeah? So the property pass, yeah? So for the robotic queries, the property paths that are most frequently occurring, uh, there are a lot of this in the Wikidata uh, query logs, yeah, a lot of property paths. So as you can see, they are very simple. They have one or two labels, yeah? And if they are concatenating uh, uh, labels with the A1, AK, they have, um, uh, you know, they, they, also, they are also occurring for 24%. Um, so we, are, we might have concatenation, yeah? Uh, for organic uh, queries, uh, the, this analysis led us to have different, uh, slightly different results because organic queries, they have unions, yeah? So they have alternation of labels. So you, what you can see here in the, with the uppercase letters, A, B star, we represent the fact that A, for instance, is uh, um, alternation of labels. It means that humans, when formulate their query, they are not sure about which label they are going to find in the graph. So they want to specify all possible labels. So they want to be as, mo as much, as more comprehensive as possible, yeah? And this is, this is interesting because alternation is really a characteristic of uh, uh, queries formulated by user users, plus clean star, as you can see, and then concatenation again. Okay, so far I was focusing on static graphs, but one uh, other aspect of graphs is their evolution. Yeah, We can distinguish between incremental graphs or dynamic graphs that are graphs that uh, can uh, actually accommodate updates and allow querying on the old and new state. But there are also streaming graphs, streams, graphs that uh, come at high speed and they are unbounded and um, they are. Uh, uh, they need to 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 have a, a, a query processing that is um, uh, actually uh, ad adaptive and uh, uh, you know it can cope with this uh, with this high um, high throughput. Yeah. Um, so um, usually uh, systems for streaming and library for streaming they just focus on queries that are very simple. They are containing only projections and aggregates, yeah? So none of these systems has considered the, the queries that I was showing you. So queries that are more complex because they contain recursion, queries that can return paths, yeah? So these are poorly investigated, yeah? So um, in another line of work, um, we've, we actually studied this problem, how we can actually uh, um, uh, create yeah, algorithms that are able to evaluate complex queries on unbound, unbounded streams. So as you can see here along the time axis, we have a, a graph which is coming one edge at a time, and then the edge can be added or can be deleted. And the graph doesn't exist at the very beginning from instant T1 to instant T12. The graph is going to be formed, yeah? And, um, and so we, we need to, to cope with this graph where streaming rates can be very high. So the idea is that we can introduce a window, a window-based semantics, and we use windows to create, uh, to batch edges, yeah? And then we can evaluate um, queries that are simple or complex with the continuous semantics. Yeah, so edges are batched in the window as they come. So what does it mean having simple uh, or complex uh, versus arbitrary path semantics? So here is, is an example. Again, Q1 is a concatenation of two labels under clean plus. Yeah, so I want to uh, uh, retrieve the pair of nodes. Uh, such that they are connected by um, a path uh, containing concatenations of follows and mentions uh, any, any number of, uh, of, um, of times. And then we, we, when we assume a simple path semantics, it means that we are not allowed to traverse um, a node uh, twice 
uh, where we assume arbitrary path semantics, we can do that. So we can uh, traverse a node twice. So the simple path semantics is usually, uh, is usually higher complexity with respect to uh, arbitrary path uh, semantics, yeah? Because in the simple path semantics, you need to check that you, uh, you don't traverse a, a, a node or an edge uh, twice, yeah? And because of that, you have higher complexity. So in the, in the paper, we have both algorithms for both semantics and we compare them for um, streaming graphs. So lately, we also worked on another problem, uh, the problem in which we want to have uh, um, uh, another uh, more, more complex queries yeah, in which we have uh, um, uh, paths uh, that are very complex. Yeah? This, uh, this path, for instance, uh, is a concatenation of, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the plus again of a recent liker. So recent liker is a, is a complex pattern, as you can see. So if you look at the picture, so a recent liker, so a person is a recent liker of another person. If this person one follows person PI and the, the, the first person likes a product on which the second person posts a message, yeah? Uh, likes a message, yeah, uh, which has been posted by the second person. So as you can see, this pattern can repeat along the way, yeah, uh, in the graph. And then we can we can uh, retrieve this uh, this pass, yeah, which is a recent liker, and we are interested in uh, what are the messages posted by by this person, yeah. This query can be expressed by GCore. So GCore is a, a proposal, one of one of the query languages that actually influenced the, the well, as an had an impact on the on the design on the current design of the GQL and the standard query language. Uh, here we introduce also another um, uh, um, component: the, the the capacity of uh, evaluating windows. Yeah, so we assume that this is a stream and uh, that our window is spanning, for instance, twenty four hours. Yeah. As you can see on the right hand side in this slide, you can see a data log program and uh, that expresses the same query. And you have this uh, uh, predicate uh, recent liker, yeah, uh, that, uh, that you can introduce. And then uh, you use, uh, you use uh, uh, clean, star, clean plus on the, on the recent liker to compute the answer, yeah. So in this work, we, we are uh, um, also defining um, an algebra uh, for, uh, for streaming graphs and uh, working on this problem of having uh, um, a, a, a streaming graph processor, uh, an end-to-end -end streaming graph processor that is able to evaluate queries and uh, uh, doing also optimization on the algebraic plan uh, for, uh, for these queries. Uh, and this is recent work that, um, uh, that uh, appeared this year in ICD. Uh, so basically, if you consider the previous queries, then you can express this uh, uh, with, uh, with an algebraic uh, plan. And then you can have uh, operators uh, that actually retrieve um, uh, the, um, the, the, the part of the queries that you need. So, for instance, uh, the, 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 the part, uh, the, the, the complex pattern that I showed you with likes, posts, and follows, this will be, will be done by using some window scans, so scans that are uh, um, uh, designed for windows. Uh, and then uh, in the tree, you go up and you have a join, and then you can have a path operator that constructs this recent like relationship. And then again, you will have to join this with another window scan on POS, and then you will have the answer at the top of the algebraic tree. So in the paper, we define all these operators, and we also uh, discuss the, their, their physical implementation. Uh, we also talk about optimization, even though optimization is a separate problem and is, uh, certainly uh, requires more, more investigation in the future. Okay, so one other uh, um, uh, interesting topic is this uh, topic that I already mentioned is uh, um, the lack of interoperability. Um, this is everywhere. So lack of interoperability actually um, is a problem because it uh, uh, doesn't let us uh, compare um, 
different uh, queries and different uh, systems and uh, also doesn't let us build, build um, uh, uh, strong benchmarks. Uh, there are different communities involved, yeah? not only data management, but also large scale systems, machine learning and data mining. So there are two uh, examples uh, uh, to, to deal with this problem of interoperability in query processing. One example is uh, about indexing yeah? and sampling. Yeah? Indexing and sampling are two techniques that are, might help to improve and predict the performances of graph queries. So in the literature, there are already works on indexing for graph queries. These works, however, are devoted to, to some particular uh, uh, graph, uh, uh, graph uh, uh, query language fragments. For instance, they are devoted to alternation of labels under a plus. Yeah? So as you can see, there are unions of uh, L1, LK, yeah? where uh, there are disjunctions. So these are called the label constrained reachability queries. And they want to check these queries, they check whether there exists a pass in the graph from source to target using only label, only edges in with labels in this label constraint, this LC. Uh, one way to cope with this is to, to use a, to use a compression on the generalized transitive closure. Yeah. So the generalized transitive closure is a, a va variant of the transitive closure in which we are going to record for every pair of vertices u v. We are going to record whether u reaches v, and we are going to compute the minimal label set from u to b, which is the set of labels. Yeah. Uh, so we are going to check whether we can remove an element from the uh, label sets. Yeah. For instance, if we have from u to v, we have two paths. One is uh, with the label sets a, b, and another is with the label set a. Of course, the minimal one will be a, so we remove a, b. And these works, they really exploit this generalized transitive closure effectively, and they show how to compress it to, to guarantee efficient query processing. So one current topic we are working with is uh, uh, to actually see whether we can do this, but on, a, on, a, on the case in which we have concatenations, yeah? So because the previous uh, approach would not work because they are uh, conceived, they are designed for alternation only. But if we have concatenation of labels, so what, what, uh, what index sh shall we use? So we, we, are, we have defined an index which is uh, um, designed for concatenation. So it's called the R R RLC, the recursive label concatenated index. And it's uh, especially conceived for uh, recursive label concatenated queries. As you can see in this example, in the index, we have uh, uh, recorded uh, the ingoing and outgoing label sets. Yeah? I will not go into the details of how this is done, but for instance, if you have a query that asks you, uh, if I take vertices in the graph that you can see here uh, depicted in the, in the slide, if I have uh, from V3 to V6, uh, I have the following query. I want to know the, if the, it exists a pass with the uh, concatenated labels L2, L1 with a plus, yeah? Then with the index, I'm just going to check whether in the index I can find um, uh, outgoing um, uh, sets of V3 and ingoing sets of V3 that contain this concatenation. And if this is the case, then the, the, the query will be evaluated to true. Okay, um, I don't know if there are questions in the chat. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to continue. Okay, so um, the last chapter that I want to um, uh, present is uh, uh, the usage of schemas and constraints for property graphs. So uh, in uh, uh, the graph world, in the uh, semi-structured uh, world, uh, the, the graphs are not defined, up, uh, the schemas are not defined up front as it was the case for relational data, right? When we, we create a relational database, Basically, we have to define the schema before populating the, the instances of the database. This is not the case for graph databases. Graph databases are inherently schemaless. Yeah, uh, there is no a priori schema constraints. But this is uh, this might become a problem if you want to do query optimization, if you want to do data integration, right? Um, so in our previous work, we we have worked on this topic since uh, a few years now. 
Initially, we were focusing on uh, uh, defining a schema uh, uh, which is on top of, uh, so with people from Neo4j, defining a schema that uh, is, um, is, uh, can, be, can be useful for property graphs. Yeah? Uh, and um, so, and the, the property graph data model is really prone to, uh, to schema discovery uh, because it's a labeled multigraph, uh, as I was showing you with the key value list attached to nodes and edges. And in this paper, we actually show uh, how by using graph transformations, we can actually check schema validation and schema evolution. In a subsequent work, we were focusing more on how to extract a schema from a graph instance, right? Because we don't expect that the user will, will have to specify a schema manually. So we are going to, for instance, the, for the COVID-19 graph, this is an example. Uh, there is no schema up front. So how do we extract a schema from, uh, from that graph and from any other graph that you will find in your application? And um, there is also an ongoing uh, property graph schema standardization process uh, that it wants to come up with a standard schema for property graphs. In the meanwhile, however, we, we need to have this schema inference mechanisms. Yeah? At the beginning, we used the um, uh, map reduce approach. And uh, we had uh, these uh, two possible solutions between uh, um, considering only label oriented approach in which we are going to consider only node labels. We are going to discover only node labels or we can also discover property uh, labels, yeah? uh, node properties. Yeah? So we have a trade-off with be between these two solutions and uh, we show the trade-off in the paper. Uh, lately this year, we applied more uh, like a statistical method to do the schema inference. We applied the hierarchical clustering using the Gaussian mixture module, model. And uh, in this case, we could have a solution which actually uh, integrates uh, properties and labels. Yeah? So we could have a, a solution that actually solves the previous uh, problems of uh, having this trade-off between label-oriented and property-oriented, yeah? Here you, you can see an example of LDBC post-node instances. And in this picture, you can see the example of the, the benchmark LDBC uh, from which we have ext extracted the schema. As you can see here, as soon as we have uh, uh, different kinds of uh, properties uh, for the post, for instance, we will have two types that are different, post one and post two. Uh, for, for that schema. Another important topic when we talk about schema is schema constraints, right? Uh, um, in uh, in uh, graph databases, there is, there, are, there is a limited support for keys, yeah? Uh, even those keys are useful, again. Some systems offer, uh, some, some graph database actually offer uh, property-based primary keys for nodes. Uh, some support unique constraints or mandatoriness, but uh, we need support to support all of this and to satisfy current practical needs. So to what we need, what we did with the um, colleagues in this standardization group, the LDBC and the GQL standardization group, group we worked on, on how to define uh, property, property graph keys. Uh, because this is important yeah, to actually have uh, uniformity among database vendors yeah? and uh, also to bring the best of academia to the needs of industry. So here you see an example of uh, uh, how to declaratively specify the scope of the key for a property graph. Yeah? For instance, uh, uh, when you have a person, then uh, the, the login of the person is the identifier of the person. So each person is identified by their login. As you can see, the, the, the constraint is basically a query. Yeah? Um, and, and then uh, another more complex example, each forum with a member is identified by na the name of the forum and the person who moderates the forum. Yeah? Um, so these are uh, really uh, examples in cipher-like syntax, but of course one can express them in any, in any graph query language that, uh, that he likes. Yeah? 
So this was part of this ongoing standardization effort. I want to spend a few words on it. So, on it. so there, there is this uh, um, ISO uh, IEC uh, GQL projects uh, together with the LDBC community, and they are working on these GQL standards. And um, I'm actually involved with the LDBC Council, especially for the property graph schema group. And their goal is to standardize query languages to make them adoptable by existing implementations. And there are a lot of uh, uh, industrial partners in this, uh, in this, um, in this group, uh, in, actually working with, the, with academia on these topics, yeah? So these are some, uh, some of the companies that are, uh, that are actually involved in, uh, in this group. Okay. I think I'm going to soon to conclude uh, because I want also to, to give a few minutes for questions. So I want to conclude, I already mentioned it a little bit all along the talk, but I want to conclude with the vision, yeah? With the vision on graph processing system. So um, uh, we met, uh, well, before the pandemic, yeah? in time before the pandemic, we met in Dagsul with a, uh, with uh, uh, many people from data management community, but also for the from the computer systems community. And uh, we were lucky because we worked together on a paper which got published the, um, in September last year in uh, communications of the ACM. So the title of the paper is uh, The Future is Big Graphs. And it contains our vision about future uh, graph processing ecosystems. So from, from the paper, I will not have time to present all of it, but from the paper here, here is a, uh, an example of what we um, expect from future graph processing ecosystem. As you can see here, there, is a, there are a lot of data sources, uh, graphs, non-graphs, relational. Then there, there are ETL processing and graph instruction processing. And in between, at the, in, the, in the middle, there are um, all LTP and OLAP operations that can be hybrid and combined together. And there are advanced processes such as machine learning, business intelligence, uh, scientific com com computing, visualization, and so on. And these processes, advanced processes, they can produce other graphs that they can be used as uh, uh, input, again, by the blue arrows to, to to the to the ecosystems, yeah. Uh, so this is one incarnation of um, uh, the 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 architecture of the ecosystems that we 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 actually expect. In the paper, we have a lot of discussion about the abstractions, yeah. This idea of lattices that I presented to you, um, the ecosystems themselves, but also the performances and benchmarking, how to to actually measure performances for this. Uh, for these systems, yeah. Um, so this, uh, the problem with the performances is uh, is very is a problem which is timely with the with this uh, all these companies, yeah. Um, there are a lot of challenges that are ahead of us, yeah, uh, for future graph processing systems. So. Um, the, these challenges have to be solved by not, not only by, by, by one community, but by several communities, yeah? by, by, um, also by theory, yeah? data management theory, data analytics, uh, but also by human computing interaction, ML, visualization, and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it's really a, um, a big challenge. Yeah? And um, I, I just want to conclude with some... Um, uh, uh, some principles that we think are underlying these um, ecosystems. Yeah, as I was mentioning, there is this combination of OLAP OLTP, yeah, uh, which is uh, which is uh, which is interesting for graphs. Uh, the standardization around graph data models and query languages, uh, reference architecture, which is in the paper. The problem of scaling up versus scaling out. Yeah, so how, how much memory do I need for graph processing, or do I need to distribute and parallelize uh, all, all, all the tasks? And then this dynamic and streaming endeavors that I mentioned. Yeah, uh, open research directions. So there are a lot in the paper. Uh, so if you if you really want to work on this topic, I suggest that you give it a read. But uh, how to make these graph data models and query languages interoperable among each other? How to define meaningful metrics to measure the performances of algorithms, uh, of uh, query evaluation, query algorithms, workflow, and so on? 
and how to generate uh, heterogeneous workloads yeah, that contain probably uh, OLTP and OLAP. So how to do benchmarking and generation for, for all these things, uh, batch versus streaming, temporal versus special and so on. And how to benchmark entire pipelines and ecosystems, including uh, machine learning and simulation. So there are a lot of topics yeah, that we can address in the future. So there is a lot to do and you are welcome to, 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 work, uh, to work on this topic too. And please do not hesitate if you, if you have questions. And since, since this is a PhD workshop, I have some, some sentence to, to give to PhD students, yeah? um, not by me, by, 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 but by Dr. Brown. In, uh, in, this, uh, in this movie uh, that I like a lot, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much for this inspiring talk. And thank you for sharing with us all these uh, nice and interesting contributions. If uh, any question from the audience, you can, you can speak or you can uh, put your question in the chat, please. No questions? Hi. No, I, I have I have a generic question. In your representation, when you represented the lattice of data models, we can see that we have RDF data model is part of this uh, graph data database uh, language. Do you do you think RDF has some advantage over other language? Uh, in fact, for for indexing for summary, do you think it is it has it's easier to do this stuff with RDF or or not? Um, uh, you know, Al, I'm not really, I mean, I've worked on RDF, but I'm not really an expert on RDF, right? I'm, I'm more like more on the graph database side, yeah? So I would not, however, counterpose the two, right? I mean, like they are different, yeah? Of course, uh, we have been experimenting in, in all my papers, yeah? I, when I do, uh, you know, I use, choose baseline. I, I try to also compare with RDF, yeah, with RDF systems, yeah. But for I, I can make you an example with indexing, for instance, yeah. Uh, so indexing is a, I would say, um, not mature in RDF as well as it's not mature in property graph databases, right? Because basically the way these systems, both graph databases and RDF systems, they do indexing is just to address one workload, yeah? And they, they, this doesn't work if we go to complex queries with recursion, yeah? So all these systems, they would fail, yeah? To use index-based evaluation with recursion. So the, the bottom line is we have to learn how to, you know, to, to prepare for this complex queries that, as, as you have seen, they are used in, in Sparkle endpoints, yeah? Wikidata contains a lot of re recursive queries, yeah? And they are timed out. So how do we cope with this, yeah? This is SparkQL, yeah? This is SparkQL, okay? But I, I, want to, I won't tell you that because I, I would have to study, yeah? I, I, of course, I'm using RDF systems and I haven't seen in the literature a lot of proposals for RDF indexing either, yeah? I think there is another question in the chat. Yes. Why did you, why did LDBC not choose to standardize data log? <laughs> okay, I like the question. Um, you know, data log doesn't need to be standardized, in my opinion, uh, right? I mean, data log has been used uh, since decades. Yeah, we don't need to standardize it. Yeah. And if you want data log, is still used. Yeah, in some of these companies. Yeah. Uh, in, in some of these companies, yeah, or um, it, it still use a data log, yeah. So data log for me is a way to, as you have seen in my examples, when I have a concrete query language, then if I go and express this query in data log, for me, it's more readable, yeah. And it's a kind of common yardstick, yeah, for, uh, for, uh, for queries. But then, of course, the, the standardization takes a different uh, direction because the, the standardization is also to consider the request for, uh, for in, from industry, yeah? So in, in, in companies, they don't want to, to completely change their query language. So the stand, it, it happened the same for SQL, right? Even though now we have a lot of SQL dialects, yeah? 
we have a lot of systems that have different variants of SQL. We hope that this will not be the case with graph databases. We have learned from that experience, yeah, and that this GQL, which is the future graph query language, will be more uniform across the system, yeah? At least this is the hope, yeah? Thank you. Another question? No? I have last a question, yes. like a provocation. You, you, you said that graph database everywhere, you have a lot of application. Do you think in a few years, uh, relational database will disappear? Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a good question. Well, uh, I, when I talk to vendors, yeah, to these companies, uh, they don't say that the the market has been complete, the, completely eaten up by 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 graph databases. They just say that people start using graphs, and they they are not like changing technology. They just start and using graphs, and they still have their uh, relational backends. But they just they want to use graphs because because somehow some operations like navigations they are much easier with graphs. So it really depends on what are their what is their use case, what what are their applications, and the one technology is not you know opposite to another. So they will coexist. I don't expect that they will uh, they will be replaced completely. You see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alberto Moya. I am a PhD student from University of Chile. And today I'm going to present uh, my thesis proposal on predicting Spark query dynamics, which is supervised by the professor Aidan Hogan. Uh, recent years have seen increased interest in querying graph, a wide variety of application use uh, graph data particularly in the context of uh, NoSQL systems, being data, knowledge graph, etc. A prominent data model for graph is uh, the resource description framework, RDF, was the standard uh, query language is uh, Sparkle. Uh, then uh, hundreds of RDF data have been published uh, on the web following the Lean Data principles. Uh, here you can see how the, the number of data set uh, publishing have grown over the year from 2007 to 2021. 20, uh, this in particular uh, context of the Link Open Data Cloud. Um, uh, this data set often provide a Sparkle service nodes and endpoint that client can query over the web. Uh, here we show two of the most prominent uh, data source a graph data source, which is Wikidata and DBpedia. They provide a public access to a structured description of millions of entities and their relations um, uh, receive uh, in order of millions of queries uh, per day from the web. Though, uh, therefore, those uh, Sparkle endpoint can suffer from uh, timeouts and intermittent availability. Also, uh, we can show that they are subject to, uh, to they are uh, changing every time. And this, these uh, changes are not always uh, adding new resources, but also modifying and deleting them. Uh, uh, therefore, it is uh, challenging to use the established way to improve the performance of the databases and web bases uh, systems, uh, which is the apply the server side or, or client side uh, catching. Uh, to present the problem here, uh, let's consider the examples. Uh, this example uh, suppose that you have an application that. Uh, required to have an updated list of people who have won uh, Nobel awards. Um, uh, we have shown that the data set uh, are dynamic, change every time, and change uh, aside or independently of the application. So the question here is, how often do we uh, need to execute this query or reevaluate this query uh, if we want to reduce the network traffic, the, the load on server, and at the same time, we want to uh, ensure freshness. 
for this uh, query specifically, maybe a GRE uh, could be uh, good enough. But uh, for other queries, like the second that uh, I am showing, uh, which ask about the planet discovered in our solar systems, could be very uh, more complex to answer this question. Um, a similar problem, uh, maybe a, a time to leave a simplification, is uh, that we call one change, change uh, estimation, which consider again the an, an sparkle query. Um, a, a dynamic RDF uh, graph uh, expressed as a set of uh, discrete snapshots uh, of the graph uh, separately with the, by the same um, interval. And uh, in this problem, we want to uh, predict uh, whether or not the result of this query will change in specifically uh, one uh, more step in the future. Uh, for that, uh, we uh, identify we identify uh, two research questions. The first one is uh, how can we identify a model and understand the dynamic of a Sparkle query and a Sparkle query results. And the second is uh, how can we use this knowledge about the dynamics to increase the consistency of a catch it query result at a lower cost. Um, then we uh, carried out a systematic literature review to find uh, potentially the answer of those questions. Um, we discovered uh, three close related uh, research topic uh, uh, to potentially answer this question or part of the question, uh, which is data dynamics, uh, synchronization, query analysis that provide a uh, some approaches that we can use in some part of our problem, but uh, we can conclude that uh, we don't find, uh, we didn't find um, much uh, work uh, specifically in predicting whether the result of the query will change in front of a dynamic RDF uh, graph. Then uh, we propose a machine learning uh, based framework to predict whether the result of a query will change uh, uh, in the future in front of our uh, dynamic graph uh, based on different kind of future. Uh, start from the query, start from the predicate and, and query, and also start from the historical result of the, of the query. Uh, if we go uh, over the, the main features, uh, the first one is uh, based on, on, on the query. Um, uh, we uh, would catch to the complexity of the query. Um, also, some uh, features of the query that maybe could be uh, correlate the, the changes. Um, for that, we include uh, some statistic keywords of, for the, of the query and some patterns of the queries. Uh, for the predicate feature, we uh, follow the intuition that a query with a more dynamic predicate uh, would be uh, more sensitive to change. And for that, we include a statistic about uh, how frequently or how many triplets that match with a predicate inside the query. Uh, have changed in, in a window of, uh, of past versions. And in the case of the degree of feature, we uh, include a statistic about the variability of the uh, number of results uh, returned by the query uh, in past versions. And uh, for reduce the, the, for reduce the, the overhead, we consider to use a, a, a function, a, a cardinality estimation function to uh, avoid to evaluate the query over the, the, the complete graph. And uh, finally, the result feature consider a statistic about how uh, these uh, results of the query have changed in the past. About, for example, as simple as the number of changes in the uh, period of uh, past version. Um, 
we hypothesize that uh, our uh, proposed, uh, sorry, we hypothesize that our proposed uh, work follow the trade-off uh, show in this picture uh, with, uh, when uh, more accurate uh, predictions imply more overhead, uh, more overhead. Uh, in the left-hand side, we show the, the query feature that require no knowledge of the data. Uh, those uh, incur in the less uh, overhead, but uh, provide less accurate uh, prediction as a consequence. Uh, then we have the predicate uh, feature, the predicate dynamic feature, uh, which require a, a high a high level statistic about the how the triplets for a particular predicate have changed in the past. Uh, then we have the degree of change that require a more uh, detailed statistics that allow us to ca calculate or compute the estimation of the cardinality of a query, but uh, provide more uh, metadata related with the sensitives of the query to change. And finally, we have the historical results uh, with uh, required the result of the query in the past version. And in the case of an unseen query, required to evaluate this query over uh, several uh, uh, past versions, and, and also required to maintain an, ind an in indices of, of those uh, versions to evaluate the, the query. Uh, then to evaluate uh, to our frameworks in front of different uh, uh, features. Uh, we consider uh, first a, a Wikidata a graph. Uh, in this case, we consider a 17 a weekly version uh, of Wikidata uh, with approximately 4.5 billion of uh, triplets. Um, also consider a one 141 uh, queries started from the uh, Wikidata query service uh, provided by the users. Um, uh, we show some statistic about the behavior, uh, the change behavior in the period uh, selected. Um, we can see that the approximately in each uh, version, uh, the half of the query have changed uh, uh, from one to, to the subsequent uh, versions. And um, also we have around 20, a query that never change, uh, around 60 that change every time and a good balance that, uh, in the behavior of the changes in this period. Also, we considered a, a DBpedia. Specifically, we use the change set provided by DBpedia Live to uh, build a 18 uh, version uh, of DBpedia uh, based on daily and daily basis. Uh, in this case, we have a much less uh, number of triplets. And we use a query provided by a reference work, uh, a 10,000 query, and we, we show that uh, there are a lot of repeat, repetitive uh, uh, or similar pattern queries. And we uh, execute a down sampling uh, based on logarithmic using the, the the predicate sets. And finally, we use uh, 256 uh, queries. Um, it is important to note that uh, in this case, we have uh, less, uh, much less uh, changes in this period. Uh, and also the majority of the query uh, has no change in the period uh, selected. Then uh, the results uh, we uh, show the Accurate, the accuracy of uh, the accuracy obtained by different classifiers in front of a different uh, group of feature, considering the query predicate uh, degree of change and results, and some of a combination of them. Um, also, we uh, uh, 
but vary the number of version, the past version that we uh, see. In, the, in this case, uh, a window of three, uh, five, and nine. And uh, uh, also, we are showing in this case the results provided by the decision tree, which was the, the best result uh, that we obtained comparing with other classifiers. Um, uh, comparing the, the group of features, you can see that the best results uh, the, that we obtained was uh, with the results, uh, the historical results uh, group of features. Um, uh, the query um, and predicate group of features uh, provide a slightly better uh, performance compared with the baselines. Uh, in this case, sorry, I forget to mention that we include in, in red uh, uh, a random, uh, random baseline that uh, randomly guess yes or no to compare with our predictions. And in the case of the degree of change, uh, we can see that uh, we found a, a slight uh, better, much better than the, than the baselines. In the case of DBpedia, we can see uh, the same uh, similar similar behavior, but in the case of the degree of change, uh, we um, observe uh, poor, uh, poor uh, results. Uh, I believe that it's, it is due to the uh, relative sparsity changes uh, also, the non-monotonic nature of the changes in the period uh, selected. Uh, also, the, the short interval, uh, only considering 18 days. days. Um, uh, the difference between wiki data is, in this case, we use uh, the interval of a week. And in this case, we use the interval of day. Um, Okay. Uh, in summary, uh, this uh, PhD proposal is uh, motivated by the goal of uh, improve the way uh, application access dynamically in data, making queries uh, more efficient uh, while ensuring freshness results. Our first aim uh, has been to understand uh, how to model the dynamic of Sparkle queries results, developing a framework to uh, predict if and eventually when the result of a query will change uh, due to changes in underlying data. Um, our results uh, confirm that the feature based on historical results provide by far uh, most accurate predictions. However, a such feature include considerable uh, overhead that may be unjustifiable, unjustifiable in, in, in use case such as caching. Uh, our intermediate, uh, our immediate next step is to explore uh, other possible uh, features that may have improved prediction without uh, needing historical results. Um, thereafter, we, we have to extend our techniques uh, to cover not only one to change prediction, but also time to leave uh, predictions. Uh, uh, and our final aim is to develop a general framework uh, for smart caching that integrate a lower cost feature to uh, improve the consistency of caching uh, and thus uh, the efficiency of the graph uh, query system in general. Uh, also, we are uh, interested to explore uh, other possible use cases uh, for, for a framework. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Alberto. Any question from the audience? No? Any question? Okay, I have one question. In, in order to make a featuring, you, you, you need, if I will understand, you need to have a query workload, no? You need to have query workload in order to compute future, no? You need that. And my yes, question yes. Is, is how you can you can you generalize your approach for unseen queries, or your model will overfit for the the current workload? Uh, yes, uh, 
in a, uh, for for this evaluation we use a set a uh, predefined pre set of queries uh, we uh, at this moment no evaluate uh, the the uh, in in considering for example a uh, query that never uh, have seen in the in the past uh, but the framework in general consider to those those cases because uh, for example the the more overhead uh, uh, feature is the consider the, the historical results so uh, for example in the case of a query that they never have seen uh, before we have to in this case we for that, we have to maintain the complete versions to evaluate the, the query. In the, in the other case, uh, we have only some part of the graph to compute uh, uh, the statistics necessary to compute the features. And um, uh, in all cases, uh, we can uh, maintain in an incremental model. Uh, ma 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 okay. Manner. Thank you very much. Any question? No. Thank you very much. And I, Tobias, you have a question. Go, please. Uh, yes, so you were targeting currently uh, Wikidata and uh, DBpedia, um, which of course they are um, like general knowledge. Um, have you um, looked into some uh, domains where you think that have some specific um, dynamic dynamicity patterns, like if you think of uh, digital twins, Internet of Things, and, and smart cities, where you say, okay, I have commute patterns, or I have light patterns that, I mean, you have daily cycles, you have certain hourly cycles, uh, and these sorts of things. And yes, that is interesting, interesting comments. Uh, I select the Wikidata and DBpedia uh, because they have, uh, of course, information uh, from different domains. And um, also in the case of uh, Wikidata, have a, a good uh, a update, update a regular updated uh, information, uh, but uh, uh, our, uh, for, for our thinking, uh, maybe uh, in those cases uh, would be more difficult to uh, capture uh, some uh, uh, patterns in the changing, but uh, at this time uh, could be uh, interesting to compare with a graph with for a specific domain because maybe uh, as you said. Uh, 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 we could obtain better results or uh, considering that maybe it's uh, easy to, to, to define uh, those uh, patterns of changing. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jaime Salas. I'm a PhD student at Universidad de Chile. And today my talk is going to be on my my thesis, which is the canonicalization of Sparkle 1.1 queries. So to begin this presentation, I'd like to state the motivation behind this work. So as, as most of you should, should know by now, Sparkle is the standard language for querying RDF and thus contains many features that make it very expressive. Furthermore, even more features have been introduced since its inception. But this, though, this means in the end that we can express the same query in different ways. For instance, here we have two queries that are identical apart from the names of the variables in each one. So here we can very clearly see that there is a one-to-one -one correspond correspondence between variables film and movie and wage and salary respectively. So in this example, we also have variables with different with different names, but we also have a redundant triple pattern. Furthermore, the triple patterns in each query are ordered differently. Now, we could rewrite both queries into another query by renaming these variables and remo removing the redundant triple patterns. 
So what we've done here is a form of canonicalization, which is computing a canonical query. Next, uh, I'd like to present some preliminaries necessary to understand this work. We're going to formalize this notion of two queries being the same. To do this, we first introduce the evaluation of our query. We're given a query Q and an RDF dataset G. The evaluation of Q over G matches the variables in Q to values in, in the graph, which would produce these results that can be viewed as a table with one column for each projected variable and one row for every result. Next is containment. We're giving two queries, Q and Q prime. We say that Q is contained in Q prime if the evaluation of Q prime contains all of the results of the evaluation of Q over any RDF data set. So this can be seen clearly in these tables where the bottom table contains all of the entries in the top table. Again, for equivalence, we have two queries, Q and Q prime. And we say that Q prime is equivalent to Q if Q is contained in Q prime and vice versa. So in simpler terms, this means that the results of their evaluations are the same over any RDF data set. Finally, we define something similar to equivalence, which we call congruence, where once again, given two queries, Q and Q prime, we say that Q prime is congruent to Q if there exists a one-to-one -one variable mapping such that Q is equivalent to Q prime with its variables mapped accordingly. So this, this is kind of like what we did for the canonical form where we relabeled some of the variables. So here we can see that if we map game to title and release to year, then both queries would be equivalent. So here we briefly present some of the complexities of Sparkle evaluation, the, the containment decision problem and the equivalence decision problem to emph emphasize how this can be a hard problem. For set semantics, uh, containment and equivalence are undecidable for the, for the full language. This is even true for back semantics, where we can see that, that containment is even undecidable for UCQs, UCQs being unions of conjunctive queries. So the, the problem we would like to address in a way is that uh, studies such as those by Builaranda et al. have shown that Sparkle endpoints present performance issues that may sometimes force the service to become una unavailable for some time. And this issue may be partially addressed by caching systems. However, the caching systems are also limited by their ability to detect du duplicate queries. So we we present canonicalization as a process of applying transformations to a query in order to compute a canonical form. In addition, we will state that the canonicalization algorithm is sound if the canonical query is congruent to the original query. And we say that the algorithm is complete if all congruent queries have the same canonical form. However, because of the results we presented earlier, we know that a complete canonicalization is not possible for the full language. However, this work aims to cover a majority of real world queries. Now, uh, I will save the hypotheses of this research followed by some of our concrete goals. So our main hypothesis is the following. First, that the majority of real world Sparkle queries can be canonicalized, modular congruence, efficiently, despite the theoretical complexity of the problem. Then we state that the canonicalization will allow us to found more repeated congruent queries in real world query logs than our baseline methods, such as um, capitalization of, of um, capitalization or white space removal. And finally, we propose that canonicalization may be useful in certain applications, such as, um, like we said, improving 
query caching systems by improving the cache hit rate. Also, we believe we may optimize queries by removing their redundant parts as by minim minimization. In addition, we, we may canonicalize queries in order to reduce the variance in training, set, training sets for question answering systems. Finally, we believe that canonicalization over logs of queries may improve analyses over them by partitioning the queries into equivalent sets. And so in order to test our first hypothesis, the first goal of our work has been to design and develop a canonicalization algorithm that receives Sparkle queries as input and outputs a canonical query such that two queries have the same canonical form if and only if they are congruent. Some additional goals we define are that this algorithm should be usable in the majority of real world queries. That is queries that are likely to be sent by users. Um, so we consider the algorithm to be usable if it covers or supports the majority of real world queries and efficient if it can process the queries in a short time. Finally, we also want to find use cases for canonicalization. I will now describe our proposed solution. So the algorithm can be divided into the following steps. First, the query rewriting, then the representation of the query as an, R as an RDF graph, followed by a minimization or removal of redundancies, then a canonical labeling to determine canonical variable names, and finally, the retrieval of the canonical query. Well, I will now explain each step in further detail. As a note, we use Apache Jena as a framework to implement all of our methods. So the first step consists in rewriting all monotone parts of a query into UCQs following a standard DNF expansion. Furthermore, we implement additional rewriting rules presented by Schmidt et al. in their st study. These mostly have to do with the distribution of optional and minus over union and the moving of filter expressions. Finally, we remove, we rename some variables in order to avoid false correspondences and eliminate variables that are always unbound. The next step consists in representing the UCQ as an RDF graph. Triple patterns like the one we show in red are reified and represented as a blank node linked to, linked to its subject, predicate, and object. Var variables are represented as blank nodes, whereas literals and IRIs are represented by literal nodes and IRI nodes, respectively. Operators such as join are represented by blank nodes linked to each of its operands. One of the advantages of this representation is that this immediately captures the commutative property of both join and union because all operands are connected to their operator by the same predicate in no particular order. So the full representation graph of the running example would look some, something like this. The next step is the minimization or removal of redundancies. So what this aims to do is reduce the query to a minimal form such that the semantic value of the query isn't altered. We have to note that the removal of redundancies may alter the multiplicities of the results, which means that this can only be applied to set semantics. With this in mind, let's look back at one of the earlier examples I showed. So we can clearly see that the last two triple patterns on the query on the right are redundant because they can be mapped into other triple patterns, which means that they do not alter the results of the evaluation of the query. So to achieve this uh, minimization, we compute the core of the representation of this conjunctive query using an efficient leaning algorithm. It is worth noting that this algorithm is potentially exponential, but it is unlikely to encounter difficult cases in the real world. We'll see the, this further ahead in our experiments. 
Then, to remove redundant CQs, we perform pairwise containment checks for all conjunctive queries as per a standard ECQ minimization. So here we have the running example, where we can see that the right graph pattern is contained in the one on the left because it's more general. Therefore, we remove the right conjunctive query from the final result. Then, to determine canonical variable names, we use an efficient canonical labeling algorithm for our DF graph. What this does is form a partition or coloring of the nodes based on the outgoing and ingoing edges of every node. What is important here is that these partitions are independent of the blank node labels. So we use, in the end, we use these colors to determine canonical variable names. So we can see that the process described is sound for all Sparkle queries because none of the individual steps alter the semantics of the query. So, so we can see that, it, at least furthermore, the process is complete for monotone queries because the graph representation is unique for congruent queries and two queries that are not congruent will never have the same graph representation. Um, so uh, I'd like now to show uh, the experiments and results we have so far. So in order to prove our first hypothesis, we process queries from the LSQ dataset, which contains queries from these following datasets. The table contains the instances of each uh, features and the total number of queries. So uh, the graphs presented here display the results of running the canonicalization method over each data set. We also show that the run times of each step in the algorithm in order to identify the most costly part of the method. Results indicate that the minimization part has the largest variance, whereas the graph representation takes the longest on average. Results are promising though, because the vast majority of the queries take well under a second. So in order to test our second hypothesis, which is how uh, finding more duplicates, we tested um, the, we compare the following methods, uh, simply comparing the queries, uh, parsing the queries into an algebraic expression, then labeling, then rewriting and labeling, and finally the whole algorithm. So we can see that our algorithm takes between 10 and 20 times longer than our baseline. But we can see that the that we do find more duplicates in each step. The lar largest jump is between the baseline and the labeling. So to wrap up, I'd like to mention some of the open problems we have. So in a similar manner to how we do for UCQs, we wish to remove redundant RPQs. Some of the ideas we have arrived at are the expansion and collapsing of, of these paths. However, each of these approaches allows us to find more redundancies while not finding others. In this example, we find we we find more uh, we find redundancies by expanding, whereas in this example, we would find more redundancies by collapsing paths. Finally, when speaking of possible use cases, currently two master's students are using the canonicalization method in two applications. One, in order to reduce variance in a set of queries used to train a question answering system in English, and another in a system that caches common subqueries in large sets of queries. We expect to further cooperate with these students and integrate our system with theirs. Finally, we clarify that most of the, the techniques used as part of the canonicalization process are not unique to Sparkle and can be applied to other query languages. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any question? No. No question. Okay, we we are out of time. I, I have one question. You, you said you have, uh, I think you answered it at the end. You can apply canalization to for all uh, real queries, even complex one. 
So at the end, you show the property pass query. You you think you can you can apply your approach to this efficiently? Um. Well, that is the, the thing so far. Uh, in our work, okay. Theoretically, uh, at least property paths are very complex. They're also undecidable in the worst case. So we our aim is not to to be able to canonicalize all property paths. We we want to identify uh, fragments of of Sparkle that that still allow a a canonical form. Uh, so so far we have thought of uh, limiting the complexity of property paths to exclude uh, complex queries inside of clean stars. So, uh, well, so far we we know that property paths that don't contain clean stars or negated property sets can be rewritten into into monotone queries and therefore into UC into UCQs. So the problem is has more to do with with clean star that that is a work in in progress still okay to, to be asked you have a question also Go uh, i also wanted to ask about property paths um because i yes. find it very interesting um otherwise uh, keep up the work <laughs> <laughs> okay okay thank you very much and with that we finish our session we will go back in a few minutes so see you and thank you very much for all of the participants. Thank you for Angela and thank you for our two, two speaker. See you in a few minutes. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sara Abdullahi. I'm a PhD student uh, at University of Hanover uh, L3S uh, Research Center. Uh, and my PhD topic is uh, developing user access models to event-centric information. Uh, let me start with some uh, core parts uh, of this PhD uh, about events, users, uh, and accessing event-centric information. Uh, some examples of events here uh, are terrorist attacks, uh, Brexit, coronavirus pandemic, uh, the events that uh, impact our global and local communities. And uh, users here are mainly uh, digital humanities researchers and social scientists who uh, analyze these significant events uh, that shape our societies. Mm, these events result uh, in a large amount of information on the web and um, users uh, require uh, uh, access models that support them in exploring information, retrieving documents uh, relevant to their questions and obtain, uh, obtaining an overview of uh, relevant information. Uh, now, um, let me talk about the challenges uh, of current approaches in uh, accessing uh, informations. Uh, first, um, it's important to uh, consider that uh, events and entities uh, have different perceptions uh, across language communities. Um, as an example, uh, let's consider that um, a user uh, in uh, Asia um, interest, uh, interested in uh, looking for information about glo global warming uh, may have different information needs compared to a user in Europe. Uh, and the problem uh, with uh, existing uh, entity recommendation methods as uh, uh, access models to exploring information is that they do not consider uh, language specific context in uh, their algorithms. Second, uh, events uh, have specific uh, features um, such as temporal and spatial features and specific uh, relations uh, such as uh, sub-event relations. Uh, as an example, Arab Spring, uh, a, a large event happened um, a few years ago, lasted for a few years, uh, happened in different countries. Uh, and Tunisian Revolution uh, is another event uh, which is a part of Arab Spring. Uh, they have sub, uh, uh, main event and sub-event relations. Uh, if uh, a researcher uh, is interested in uh, retrieving documents about uh, Arab Spring, uh, they might uh, miss uh, the documents talking about uh, Tunisian Revolution, because Tunisian Revolution uh, is completely relevant to uh, Arab Spring, but if these documents uh, don't contain Arab Spring uh, in them, uh, they are not retrieved by current uh, document retrieval algorithms. 
Uh, and finally, uh, web archives as, as uh, essential uh, resources uh, for studying events, uh, especially the perception of events during their happening times. Uh, the, the interfaces of these web archives uh, return thousands of, return, uh, of results, uh, which is challenging for researchers to find uh, the information they were uh, looking for. Um, and uh, the manually created uh, collections in, in the web archives uh, are also, um, they could partially solve this problem, uh, but the, pro uh, the other problem with them is that um, uh, they are not necessarily covering all important information related to events and they are not uh, updated. Uh, let me uh, talk about uh, the main goal in this PhD. Uh, the main goal is designing and uh, developing user access models to event-centric information uh, to support uh, researchers uh, at different stages uh, of their research about events. And the core uh, hypothesis is that uh, by using the representation and the specific uh, features of events, uh, in knowledge graphs, uh, we could uh, capture related information in different sources uh, like documents uh, or uh, other knowledge graphs. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention uh, event kg knowledge graph uh, that my work uh, largely uh, relies on it. Uh, event kg is a multilingual uh, knowledge graph integrating uh, information from different uh, sources on knowledge graph and it is multilingual. Uh, the figure in this slide uh, shows a simple uh, and a small example of how events uh, and their features are represented uh, in this knowledge graph. Arab Spring here uh, is the main event. It shows that uh, Tunisian Revolution is uh, one of its uh, sub-events, and it shows that uh, this um, event has happened in Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, now, um, uh, Let's uh, talk about uh, different uh, stages of uh, researchers' uh, work about events. Uh, researchers um, uh, may start by exploring if information about event to gain uh, insight about uh, the main topic of their interest, the main event. Uh, they might be interested in uh, seeing which concepts or which other entities are related to the main events. Uh, then uh, they uh, look for information uh, in documents uh, relevant to their uh, to the main event uh, to find questions to their uh, to find answers to their questions and finally uh, they need a comprehensive uh, reference uh, which is a collection of the documents covering all essential information related uh, to an event talking about the challenges and uh, these different stages of the research uh, we uh, aim at um, uh, developing uh, different components. This shows a unified workflow, different steps that, that tries to address dimension challenges. Uh, uh, we start uh, with creating a language specific data set, uh, which is required to create um, a language specific event recommendation uh, algorithm. Uh, then in step three, uh, we uh, develop uh, event document retrieval. And uh, finally, we uh, uh, create a model to automatically build event collections from web archives. Uh, to um, work on these uh, four steps, we use different resources uh, such as Wikipedia ClickStream, EventKG, MS Marco, uh, which is a publicly available standard data set for document retrieval, and we use uh, available web archives. Let's, just, uh, let's talk about uh, the steps uh, one by one. Uh, in the first step, uh, which is uh, creating a language-specific data set, uh, we, our main aim is to uh, provide relevance scores among, among entities and events in a language context. We use this data set uh, to train our uh, language-specific event recommendation model. Uh, to create this data set, uh, we use um, two resources. The uh, first one is Wikipedia Clicker Stream. Uh, that uh, shows uh, users' uh, interaction with events and entities uh, in different um, language versions of Wikipedia. And second, event KG knowledge graph that I mentioned before. Next uh, is a step two, uh, which is uh, developing a language-specific event recommendation algorithm. Uh, this algorithm uh, generates a list of related events to the user's query in a language-specific context. Um, 
the first step uh, to develop this algorithm is to uh, create language specific embeddings of entities and events. Then uh, we extract uh, features, uh, different features such as uh, special, uh, temporal, uh, and link based features uh, from event KG. Uh, and we train a learning to rank algorithm to uh, create our final. Uh, recommendations. And to train this learning uh, to rank algorithm, we use the data set mentioned in step uh, one. Next is uh, creating, uh, developing a, an event document retrieval algorithm. Uh, this algorithm uh, uh, considers event-centric information from event KG knowledge graph as external information and incorporate them into a document retrieval task. We start with creating a uh, a data set uh, for training this uh, algorithm. Uh, we create this data set uh, using uh, MS Marco data set and we enrich it uh, with features from Event KG Knowledge Graph. Uh, we use, uh, then we use um, a large pre trained language model such as BERT and we fine tune it based on our uh, own problem and our own setting. And we incorporate uh, event centric features uh, from Event KG Knowledge Graph. Uh, such as temporal information, sub-event information, um, and uh, spatial information. Our intuition is that these event-centric uh, features extracted from event KG uh, is able to refine uh, the queries and um, find the relevant documents, um, event-centric documents related to the main event uh, and cover uh, important information related to the event. This uh, figure shows uh, uh, the steps of uh, developing uh, this event document retrieval algorithm. Uh, here from the left, we start uh, with query uh, and we use event KG to uh, construct uh, our query and expand our query. And then we use the uh, trained document retrieval uh, algorithm uh, to um, provide a ranked list of documents related to the main event. And uh, this slide shows how we use event KG to construct our query. We use, uh, we extract uh, event-centric features from uh, event KG, and then we rank them uh, and use uh, the top uh, features uh, to refine our query. And the uh, uh, green and uh, orange part, uh, orange, uh, figure here uh, at the bottom shows an example of how we could uh, refine our query. We, uh, we use uh, special new tokens that shows location of events, uh, actors uh, of the event, description, sub-events, uh, spatial and uh, uh, temporal information. Uh, in step four, uh, which is uh, building uh, um, event collections from web archives. Uh, our aim is to uh, create uh, comprehensive collections from web archives that uh, researchers uh, could use as um, uh, a complete uh, reference for their work. Uh, first, uh, we use by uh, we start by collecting initial document sets uh, from uh, web archives uh, using keyboard search interface of them. Um, uh, they they usually uh, use a standard. Um, uh, algorithms and uh, uh, indexing techniques uh, to retrieve, retrieve um, the uh, initial set of uh, results uh, based on the query. Uh, then uh, we employ the snippets. Uh, here the um, difference uh, with a document retrieval algorithm is that um, uh, unfortunately uh, all the websites in web archives are not um, uh, available and we only have access to some of them. So instead of using uh, the documents of uh, websites in web archives, we uh, employ uh, snippets of each document of each uh, web document. Uh, and uh, finally, we employ uh, event document uh, retrieval algorithm that uh, we uh, develop in step three to re-rank the initial collections uh, and uh, select the top most related documents. But to create these collections, uh, that has the main goal of being uh, complete in terms of different uh, features of events, we ensure to query uh, all sub-events. For example, uh, again, the example of Arab Spring, which is the main event, and we ensure that we are retrieving the documents related to all sub-events, such as uh, Tunisian Revolution. And we also um, make sure that uh, we are covering all uh, spatial and uh, temporal features uh, of the events. And uh, now uh, let's uh, move uh, to the results uh, that I've had so far. Uh, 
first, uh, I have created uh, the language specific data set, which is called Event KG uh, Plus Click, and it's uh, publicly available. Uh, it is uh, currently in three languages German, French, and Russian, and uh, it has about uh, 50,000 events uh, per language. Uh, it also has relevance uh, scores, uh, language-specific relevance scores uh, that I used to, uh, to develop um, language-specific event recommendation uh, algorithm. Uh, next, um, uh, we have uh, developed a language-specific event recommendation, uh, and this table shows uh, uh, our results. Uh, the table uh, indicates that our approach uh, represented in the uh, final uh, row uh, outperformed the baselines um, uh, based on NDCG scores in three languages. Uh, and our baselines are uh, embedding based and uh, linked based um, uh, entity recommendation algorithms. Uh, next, uh, um, about our event uh, document retrieval algorithm, which is a still an ongoing project. Uh, I have uh, some results for this algorithm. Uh, this results uh, again indicates that our approach uh, using different features of events in uh, query construction and uh, using uh, event KG uh, has um, higher uh, NDCG scores compared to baselines. The uh, last two uh, uh, methods are uh, baselines and information uh, retrieval uh, uh, task. Uh, and it shows that, for example, uh, using um, sub-events, uh, textual sub-events uh, from event KG knowledge graph or uh, a special information such as uh, places that an event has happened uh, help us to get better results compared to the uh, standard uh, document retrieval algorithms. And uh, regarding uh, the last step, which is uh, building uh, event collections, uh, event collections from uh, web archives, this uh, is a work um, uh, I have uh, started recently, uh, and this is an uh, ongoing work. Uh, to summarize, um, I talked about uh, the main goal of my PhD, uh, which is um, uh, designing and uh, developing user access models to event-centric information uh, to support uh, researchers in exploring events in information retrieval uh, and in uh, accessing, uh, to, uh, accessing comprehensive refer references uh, for their works. And to uh, support uh, users in, the, in these three uh, stages, uh, stages of their research, um, uh, uh, my PhD has uh, four components, uh, a language specific data set, a language specific event recommendation, uh, an event document retrieval algorithm, and uh, a method to build uh, event collections from uh, web archives. Um, okay, that was uh, my presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Any question? No question? No. Maybe. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? We had today in the morning, we started with an interesting presentation about uh, multilingual question answering, right? And then we discussed a bit about how machine translation can help in this context in the multilingual information analytics um, and in question answering there. So the, how do you see it? How, how do you see the role of machine translation in these applications? Do you think they are helpful? Um, um, I think, let me uh, bring this uh, here. Uh, so machine translation and uh, uh, question answering, uh, I think uh, could be useful in step two. Uh, I haven't worked on uh, question answering and I haven't used them, but I think that uh, using uh, question answering results uh, would help in uh, exploring information. Um, maybe it could be useful to uh, get uh, related uh, entities in a, a language uh, specific context. Do you think uh, it would also help to create uh, recommendation models like you're doing with the translation? Um, or is it limited? Uh, uh, machine translation? Uh, yes, I think maybe it could be useful for recommendation. Uh, partially to help with some parts of it. 
Yeah, it might be interesting to explore, right? Yes, yes, it seems uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a, a question I misunderstand. Uh, you, you built the event K KG or it's you you have it in your team? Uh, event KG, uh, uh, yeah, this is a, a knowledge graph uh, developed uh, by uh, one of my colleagues and actually one of my supervisors uh, a few years ago. And uh, my work uh, relies on it to get uh, features, event-centric uh, features uh, for events and entities. But I think if you want to build such a knowledge graph, you need to be expert in that domain, no? Because to find this type of relation no? or... Um, yes, uh, uh, and actually event KG's integration of different sources and knowledge graphs, uh, they are integrated uh, to represent um, uh, events uh, in uh, from different sources, from different knowledge graphs. Okay, I have small uh, remark about the representation. I, I am not in the in area, it was not easy for me to follow, but I suggest to you if, if you can add a concrete example for each step in your presentation. It's easier for someone not in the area to follow because you have you detail all the step, but I miss a concrete example for to apply each or maybe. Yeah, yeah. You mean so for um. Yeah, for each step. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for uh, suggestion. Yeah, it would be uh, much easier to follow. Yes, of course. Thank, thank you very very much. Any question? No. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Gaël Poumedar. I'm a third year PhD student at the Université de Lyon in France. And I'm gonna tell you about my work on interaction and information spread. So first of all, a bit of motivation. Every minute on the internet, there are 400 hours of videos that got uploaded on YouTube, 500,000 comments that get published on Facebook, 350,000 tweets that get published on Twitter, etc. So this is a lot of information, a lot of data to process. Here, I represented what you could come across when you're scrolling Reddit, typically. Here, it's a sample from the subreddit R News, and this is a lot of data. When you see this bunch of information, you want to understand how it got generated in the first place. So, first of all, this bunch of data can be summarized in terms of clusters or, or topics. Here, I represented those clusters uh, with the color code. So, in red, we have all the topics that talk about New Zealand, in blue, all the topics that talk about machine learning, and in green, all the ones that talk about climate change. Our guess is that there are hidden interactions between those topics and that these interactions will play a consequent role in the way this data is generated. So this is the topic of my PhD, my PhD thesis. Uh, it's modeling the interaction between pieces of information and characterizing their role in information spreading processes. So lots of definition in this title, in this problematic. So first of all, what do we mean by information? A piece of information is any item that's susceptible to spread, typically a tweet or a news, a Facebook post, a meme, etc. And an action will be a user reaction to one of the species of information. So the user can retweet a tweet, it can share a news, it can like a Facebook post, etc. And by interaction, we mean when the joint effect of several pieces of information is different than the product of their independent effect. So if the probability of an action X given A and B is different from simply the probability of X given A times the probability of X given B, we say there is an interaction. And this is what we're trying to model and to evaluate the role of interaction in a real world data set. So a little bit of state of the art uh, before going into technical details. Uh, there have been very few work that consider the topic of interaction modeling from a machine learning perspective. To the best of our knowledge, the first of all, the, the first of them all is Clash of the Contagion by Seth Meyers and Joel Escovec uh, in 2012, where they try to they assume the block structure between the pieces of information and model how the pieces of information interact with each other in the probability of a retweet. Uh, and another work that does a similar thing using OX processes to model time is uh, Zarazad and Correlated Cascade work published in 2017. And to the best of our knowledge, those are the two sole works that try to tackle the problem of inter interaction modeling from a machine learning perspective, because there have been a lot of other works, theoretical works, that tackle the problem, but they do so by first defining micro rules. So typically, okay, this node will get contaminated by this node given there was that 
according to this rule that they defined with that much of ground truth, then they observe the aggregated effect, the global statistics that they get from this process and compare it to the actual data. But the problem is that there is no actual learning from a data set. So they are defining the rules first and then comparing how the rules compare with real world statistics. So this is not what we're trying to do here. So, but what we're trying to do, a first attempt to model uh, interaction in spreading processes was to use stochastic block models. So on this picture, I represent what stochastic block models do. You have a network, uh, which is basically a set of nodes that are connected uh, by pairs, we, by links. And you're assuming that sets of nodes behave in a similar way. So here, for instance, all of the nodes that are here with a red background, they connect in a similar way to the nodes that are on the blue or a green background. So instead of if inferring those, I don't know, thousands of links between each pairs of nodes, we can infer only six links between each cluster of nodes. So that was our first approach uh, to cluster pieces of information uh, well, into cluster. So here our nodes are the pieces of information, typically the tweets, and the links represent the outcome given a pair of pieces of information. So a pair of tweets, a pair of words, a pair of news, etc. And the link represents whether the user tweeted, retweeted this, or whether he liked it, or he shared it, etc. So those are our first results. We apply this method to four data sets, a PubMed data set, Reddit data set, Spotify data set, and Twitter data sets. And without going too much into the details, the important point here is that interactions are sparse. They do not happen often. On the heat maps here, I represent the interaction strength between pairs of clusters. And we see that even between the clusters, there are very few significant interaction. Uh, the significant interactions being here plotted in dark. Uh, so this work got published at Rexis in 2021, and our conclusion was that significant interactions are rare. Then we tried to tackle the problem of the temporal dimension of interactions. So now what we're trying to see is how long those few interactions last over time. So this is the process we're trying to modelize. Imagine this is a Twitter feed of a Twitter user. This user first got exposed to tweet A, then to tweet B, then to tweet B again, and then it got exposed to tweet A again. But at this time, he decides to retweet tweet A. This is why this case is in orange. And what we're trying to model is whether this was retweeted only because the user liked A, so whether this decision was independent, or if it was influenced by the fact that there was B appearing at a time delta T equal one before, or B at a time delta T equal two before, or because of A at time three before, etc. So is that an independent decision or has it been influenced over time by the previous species of information? Here we plot the results of our model. Well, one example uh, of our model, we represent the probability of retweeting a piece of information a time delta t after the appearance of another given piece of information here. And this is typically what we will see uh, in subsequent experiments, is that this probability, this influence of a first piece of information will decay over time. So this is what we highlight here. Those, those plots are exactly the same plots as this one, but seen from the top, basically. So in red, is when there is an increased probability of retweeting a piece of information given the presence of another piece of information time delta t before this piece of information. So we did that on three different data sets, so Twitter data set, a NATS data set, and a prisoner's dilemma data set. And our conclusion was that interactions do not last long in time, over time on social networks. So typically on Twitter, we see that the interaction greatly increases the probability of retweeting an information at very short time, at delta t equal one, delta t equal two. But after seeing, let's say, three other tweets, this probability of information is not influenced anymore by the first piece of information once so before. So that correlates with the finding of clash of the contagions that I told you about before. It correlates with other, other findings on simply the way that it propagates uh, on social networks, etc. So this was our second conclusion, conclusion and that got published at ECML PKD in 2021. Um, so now let's summarize a little bit. We presented two approaches using stochastic block models and temporal network inference. And our conclusion is that, are that interactions are scarce, meaning they do not happen often. 
this highlights the need of clustering the PC DOM information together before hoping to spot interaction terms between them. Our second conclusion is that interactions do not last long in time, they are brief. So you cannot model interaction in the correct way if you do not model time. So basically modeling time, modeling the temporal dimension is necessary. And overall, despite the interactions being short and being rare, we see that interaction overall improve the dataset description. I didn't show you the metrics, but basically accounting for interactions improve our predictive performances on real-world dataset. So how do we do that? Uh, our lead is to use the Dirichlet Ox processes that allow to jointly model clusters and their temporal dynamic interaction. So the Dirichlet Ox processes got published uh, by Nandu and Al at KDD in 2015, uh, and it takes the form of a Dirichlet Ox prior. It is used in Bayesian inference algorithm. So I represent the Dirichlet Ox process here in a symbolic way. So you're trying to infer for a new document, here the new post opening at time t equals three, the probability that it belongs to either the red or the blue cluster, given the text of this new post, the time of publication of this new post, and the history of publication that appear before this new post. So we'll model the text using whatever language model that we can use here, it will be a Dirichlet multinomial model, and we'll model the time as a Dirichlet hoax process. So the, without entering the specifics, the, the important point here is that each cluster, red or blue, is associated to a hoax intensity function that is directly linked to the probability of this piece of information appearing over time. So this is the instantaneous probability for this piece of information appearing over time. And our prior knowledge will be that this new post, it will have a given probability to belong to a cluster according to the textual model, and it will have a given prior probability to belong to each of those clusters according to the intensity of the temporal dynamics at the time it appeared. Okay, so that's the Dirichlet Ox process, and it allows us to directly model time. So our first contribution that got published at ICDM in 2021 was to develop the power Dirichlet Oaks prior. So the main difference here is that instead of assuming that an observation here is a given probability to belong to each of the cluster that depends only on the time, we'll break the linear dependency on the Oaks process to make it nonlinear. So basically we will take this quantity, put it at the power R that will control the gap well, the importance of the gap between several prior probabilities of belonging to each of the clusters here. So when R is small, the gap here is reduced. When R is one, we, we recover the Dirichlet Ox process. And when R is large, the gap between those two probabilities increases a lot. So here, what's important to notice is that controlling this linear, the linearity of the dependence on the temporal dimension allows to tackle challenging situation. So typically our approach works best when we have a scarce textual information, typically short text on Twitter or headlines when there are overlapping vocabularies. And also when we have a scarce temporal information, meaning our publication dynamics are entangled, our approach works better. Uh, and one nice thing that we can do using the Power Dirichlet Ox process is to generate summaries on the real-time axis of the topic that got automatically inferred. So here, each of those topics, each of the colors is one topic. We write the, the, the keywords of each of these topics here. Basically, we can see when there is a new topic appearing, here, for instance, the Notre Dame fire in April 2019, uh, our model spots that automatically in a completely unsupervised way using the temporal dynamics to model the information flow. So this is one application of the, the power directly Ox prior. But here, we saw that the clusters could only self-replicate, self-replicate, sorry. So here, the pink cluster can only trigger ulterior observation from the same cluster. So this cluster cannot trigger observation from the green cluster. So our approach is to develop, and this is a work in progress, so we haven't done that yet. This is where we'd like to go during my third year of PhD. We would like to modify the, the power Dirichlet Ox process so it can consider multivariate Ox process instead. So this will result in the multivariate power Dirichlet Ox prior process where here the red cluster can now have an influence on the blue cluster and the blue cluster can now have an influence on the red cluster too. The clusters are not independent anymore. So we managed to implement that. Uh, we submitted this work at uh, ECML PKD 2022 for now. 
And well, here are our first results. Here is something that we can infer. It's the topical interaction network of the time. So we took the whole data, the whole data from Reddit, uh, from the subreddit R News over 2019, and we plotted the evolution of the interaction between each of between the most populated clusters over time uh, using the multivariate power Dirichlet Oaks prior. So here the color of the links represent the interaction strength between the clusters. So each of the clusters here is similar to what I showed you before. They have uh, keywords associated. So this could be typically the, the Notre Dame fire cluster, uh, well, which is not, I'm not representing the exact composition of the clusters on this picture, but basically we can access the information of topical interaction between cluster in a dy dynamic way and over time. So as time goes, the interaction evolves. So this is a nice first result. And then as we, sh uh, as I showed before, we can also generate a uh, timeline uh, summaries here. So this is the same plot as I showed you before, only seen from the top again. So typically we see we can unveil uh, the New Zealand Christchurch mosque attack that happened around the 15th of March here. Our model uh, automatically unveils it uh, over time. We can unveil other uh, nice things like, for instance, ISIS uh, destroying uh, Syrian monuments. This is the cluster here. We have uh, Greta, Greta Thunberg uh, protest and climate change here. This is the cluster that appears around the 13th of September, etc. So this is the information we can access using the multivariate power Dirichlet Oaks prior. So this is a work in progress. And well, I hope I will be able to come back to you to, to present you what I, what I did in more detail uh, using the multivariate probability Euclid Oaks process and how it, it can be used to model interaction and information spread. And by then, I thank you for, in, for your attention and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for this interesting presentation with a lot of interesting results. I have, it's not my area, but I, I have a question. You, you, the last contribution is about to go to uh, interaction, cluster interaction network. And, and yes. what, what kind of conclusion you can make when you see that there is some interaction between this cluster? How you can interpret this result? So Does the it, thing we would like to access is to see whether there are some topics that strongly trigger each other like for instance if uh, i don't know if you have a topic that talks about sports uh, i don't know whatever country winning a world cup in in soccer uh, you would like to see if this influences some political recuperation so you would like to see how the sports topic might have an influence on the political topic typically that's one of the results we would expect and what well, ultimately we would like to see if there are some hidden correlations because this one might seem obvious but we'd like to see if there are some that are unsuspected in uh, in the way that that flows we we'll like i don't know in as a motivation it could help to tackle uh, the spread of false news on the internet for instance how these groups self sustain etc okay interesting and the last result uh, you you did that on twitter the what to, uh, yeah this is uh, on twitter from tweet the last result about the uh, topics timeline sorry you heard me ah i got he was disconnected yeah. ah. We seem to have problems with Gael, so... Hello, sorry, I just connected to my phone internet, the auto okay. network is not working. So what did you say, sorry? The, the, the question is, what you show, the last result is coming from Twitter, is that this... Uh, uh, no, this is from from uh, Reddit, sorry. Okay, okay. So I didn't have the time to, to, to explain it in details, but basically we, we, well, there is this nice website which is called pushshift.eio, uh, where there is basically dumps of the whole Reddit data that are available. So we downloaded basically the whole of Reddit over the year of 2019. And then we extracted the content of the subreddits, uh, R News and R True News, and R Not The Onions, well, anyway, major news websites. And we ran our model. So we were left with uh, 100,000 events, headlines that got published. And that's where this graph comes from. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? No? No questions? No? 
I don't see. <coughs> no question? Okay. Thank you again, Gael. And we. Thank you very much. So, hello, I'm Tim Kutzlo. I'm a PhD student at Leibniz University of Hanover. And I'll talk a bit about comprehensive event representations using event knowledge graphs and natural language processing. So, starting off with knowledge graphs in general. So, as we know, knowledge graphs are a convenient way to store relations between uh, entities and other entities and literals. And some famous examples include DBpedia, Yago, Wikidata. However, the world is uh, dynamic and it can be fully represented with static relations such as when or where someone was born. So for this, we use event-centric or event knowledge graphs, examples of which could include event KG and OEKG. And here below we see a schema of event KG, but this is kind of hard to read. So to put it into the real world, so event relations, which are relations between events and entities or literals. So for example, given an event of type lawsuit, we might have uh, properties or relations for court, defendant, plaintiff. Uh, similarly, for a different type of event, such as shooting, we could have perpetrator, number of deaths, and number of injured. And this, of course, can be modeled inside an event knowledge graph. Uh, but before I continue on with this, maybe I should first ask what are events actually? So I would say that I think most of us would say that events are occurrences of societal importance that have a set of participants, uh, time and the location. And we could have things like Brexit, European migrant crisis, COVID pandemic as examples of such events. However, given the examples that I've given just now, maybe I should revisit the definition and say that these are actually named occurrences of societal importance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we take a look at, and these are the kind of events that we would typically model in event knowledge graphs. However, if we take a look at uh, a natural language processing context, here we uh, define events slightly differently. They're a bit more fine grained, and you could actually consider them as sub events of these uh, named events. So, for example, Theresa May's visit to Berlin is not typically something we would model in an event knowledge graph. However, it is exactly what we would extract in natural language processing uh, task of event extraction. And this could be structured something like this, a tuple where the visit in this case is the event trigger. So that's the word that most succinctly describes the event and the other colored words would be the arguments. But if you take a look at another example, so here the firebombing attack of the city of Kobe, we can see that these arguments, event arguments, the colored words could be matched pretty cleanly to properties in an event knowledge graph. Uh, in fact, we had exactly uh, perpetrator and number of dead previously as an example. And this is kind of what my work is uh, built around. I want to bring the semantic web community's modeling of events to the natural language processing extraction process of events. So the basic thesis goals are to build comprehensive sub-event aware event representations and to contextualize these uh, event representations and enrich them further. So since I've already spoken about sub-events to some degree, I'll now touch on event contextualization and enrichment. So when I talk about contextualization, uh, basically, while static information such as time and location of a given event is understood across languages, the impact of a given event depends on the specific populations and varies across linguistic and cultural contexts. And we think that we can capture this impact uh, across time through the lens of quotes by persons of public interest. So for example, tear down this wall in the context of the fall of Berlin by uh, President Ronald Reagan or via Schaffendas by Angela Merkel in the context of European migrant crisis. And this is the kind of uh, thing that we want to capture and measure the impact of across languages and cultures. Uh, as far as the enrichment is concerned, we want to enrich our events with more fine-grained location information. So what we have right now in event knowledge graphs 
for events such as 2022 Winter Olympics is maybe a location such as China or maybe Beijing. But what would be ideal is to capture the specific venue in which an event occurred, if possible. In this case, that would be Beijing Bukesong Sports Center. And this is the kind of thing we focus on here to get specific geographic coordinates, if possible, for events. So going back to the overall picture, so what we want is to build comprehensive sub-event aware representations. We want to contextualize them and enrich them. And we do this by sub-event extraction for the sub-event aware event representations. And for the contextualization and enrichment, we want fine-grained locations and quote extraction and cross-lingual alignment so uh, we align the quotes across languages. Okay, so going back to events. Uh, so given an example such as this one, the bombing of Kobe in World War II, what we want to do is we want to detect the type of an event. So this is clearly an attack of some sorts. And the, we want to have the most precise possible class for the event. So in this case, that would be aerial bombing, much more specific than attack per se. And we want to get these event arguments and match them to specific target ontology properties. So we do this via question answering and I'll show a bit how the process goes. So basically we have kind of a candidate pruning approach. So first we start with ACE ontology, which is an ontology of events used in NLP context. So that would be something like attack. It's quite generic. And we uh, want to match them to initial candidate set. So basically each attack is uh, either a military operation, a naval battle, a battle, a war, and so on. And each of these have their subclasses, which we extract via question answering. So basically for each of the properties that a given Wikidata class in this case, but it has target ontology, has, we ask, for example, where did the military operation occur? Where did the naval battle occur? And then based on the confidence score of our question answering model uh, and whether we get a response to begin with, we filter out candidates and get new candidates. So basically subclasses of the original classes. So uh, aerial bombing is a subclass of military operation. And finally, as we reach all our properties, uh, as we reach all the relations that we can get from this, we get kind of this sort of modeling of an event where we know it is an aerial bombing. We know the perpetrator, the target, the location and point in time, because this is, this is the information that is available inside the text snippet from which we uh, extracted the event. So the basic pipeline goes something like this. So given a text about an event E, we detect based on our ACE ontology. So is it an attack or maybe something else general like transport? We now have the text in which this event occurs and where we expect to find also the arguments. Then given target ontology O, we generate the questions, the constraints and all the things that we expect to find there. And then in an iterative process, we refine our candidates until we get finally the sub-events and their relations, which we match to some greater event, which I've given an example before uh, of Brexit has many different sub-events and any war has not only battles, but also meetings between politicians, document signings and so on. So continuing from there uh, to talk about event contextualization and enrichment, I've already mentioned it has quote extraction and fine grained location extraction. So starting off with quote extraction, this is the full pipeline of our approach to quote to build quote KG. This is a, a paper that has been actually accepted uh, due to appear on ESWC. Uh, it's a multilingual knowledge graph of quotes, and I'll go through uh, each of the steps. So first of all, we start with a Wikimedia project. Uh, as a data source, it's Wikiquote, an online collection of quotes. It uses media Wiki markup. It currently has 67 languages with 270,000 pages, where each page is on a given topic or a given person. And then all the quotes about the topic or the per or said by the person are on that page. And different languages are formatted differently. Here we see two examples. So English is very unstructured. On the other hand, French uses templates. So we have to build specific rules 
to find the quotes on the page for different languages. And we extract these page trees uh, with some constraints. Uh, here we see some quotes by Joe Biden, and we see that even within a language, there's a bit of a different structuring on information. Maybe you can take a look at the subline below where this is not a quote, it is uh, context information behind the quote. So we limit our extraction process uh, we basically extract all the pages that are about persons and that uh, of languages that uh, have at least 50 pages. And this ends up with us having 55 languages in the end. This is the quotation schema that we use. So here I should define what uh, quote mention is. Basically, each quote is translated to different languages, either very cleanly translated, but sometimes it might not be translated at all. For example, Yes, We Can by Obama is known in its English form and is not uh, very uh, often translated to other languages. So even a German page of Obama might have Yes, We Can instead of the German variant of it. So what we want to do is we want to cluster all these quote mentions together. We want to get the sentiment analysis, which we do on these quotes. And we also want to gather some context information, such as uh, the source of the quote. So maybe some publication, a journal, a newspaper. And we also want to get all the mentions of so the entities and events that occur within the context or the quote itself, as well as the year, date, and so on. And after we uh, have this, we align them. For the alignment, we use a language agnostic transformer model. And here on the right, we see uh, a manual evaluation that we did. So basically, we built a ground truth uh, set. And the, as we can see the, on, on the most lower line, the, uh, the clustering has been accomplished quite precisely. And uh, this leads us to having quote KG, which is a multilingual knowledge graph of quotes. We've extract, extracted 69,000 uh, quotes by 69,000 individuals, so uh, people of public interest. And we have 880,000 quotes, 960,000 quote mentions. So th those would be, be without the clustering. And we've also extracted near half a million contexts for these quotes. And uh, from there, going to the last bit, which would be the fine-grained location extraction, this is very uh, in the initial stages, uh, the work. So what we want to do here is we want to fill empty location nodes and retrieve more precise location information for the existing ones. So we start off with event KG as a data source. Here we already have some locations and to refine them and extract more of them, we use Wikipedia. When we extract a specific entity, we want it to have its uh, specific uh, geographic coordinates, we use OpenStreetMap. And the basic approach that we have in mind is to use a combined approach of link prediction, so on the knowledge graph and the location extraction from text. Uh, we think that these tax tasks are quite similar in nature and would probably benefit for, from parameter sharing while doing this uh, task. And to give just one more example, uh, apart from the Olympics one, uh, this is an example of a recent earthquake that has happened in uh, the Bosnian village of Strupici. And uh, on Wikipedia, the, the actual location is listed as only the whole of country of Bosnia and Herzegovina and not the specific village of Strupici. So this is the kind of thing that we would want to extract. And uh, just some preliminary statistics that kind of motivates our work is that from event KG, we have 700,000 events, 500,000 locations. However, only 50,000 of those have coordinates. So this is kind of, we, we see there's plenty of room for improvement and this is kind of what we want to focus on. Or maybe I should say, I, I want to focus on. <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, the whole thing would kind of look like this. Basically we use OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia for the fine granular location extraction. For sub-event extraction, we use Wikipedia linked with Wikidata as the target ontology. And finally, Wikiquote is used for quote extraction. We already have quote KG, and now it's a matter of building this sub-event aware event knowledge graph. And that will be it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the representation. Any question? No. 
No question. I don't see anyone. I, I have, yeah, Gael, you have a question? No? No one? Okay. I have a, a, a some question in in your when you try to make asking a question or the question are a, you you translate the question to a some sparkle query like you answer what where something like that you cannot uh, trans, you cannot uh, produce a complex question like what we we saw in other presentations such as uh, property pass or something like that only you could translate to no. That's... Do you, I'm sorry. Do you do you mean uh, this? Uh, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So so the the data source here is text. So we use a question answering model trained on text to uh, extract uh, a string answer, which we later match to entities and okay. specific wiki data types and classes. So you have only some question like that. Okay, where, what, something like that. Yes, okay. exactly. Uh, that are matched to specific properties and specific event classes. So we wouldn't need to find a court for a shooting, but we would need to find a perpetrator. Okay, it's a sample queries. Okay, any question? No, thank you very much for the presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Bai Han Ling from Columbia University. Today I'm gonna to talk about my thesis project geometric and topological inference for deep representations of complex networks. Complex networks are everywhere in our daily life. For instance, on the left, we have a citation networks of all the literature. And on the top, we have a deep neural network, which has been very popular these days. On the bottom, we have a functional brain connectivity network. And on the right, we have a gene regulatory network. All those type of networks, you have different features, you have different nodes, they also have different edges. Yeah, so consider these five nodes. They could be like five individuals in a social network. Their relationship can be characterized by their pairwise degrees of separation in the networks. Or they could be characterized by the dissimilarities of their profiles, or by some sort of geometric distances between their homes. Each of these topological and geometric summaries can be expressed in a square matrix of pairwise relationships. The research questions that we're interested in today is how to compare two different types of networks. And these should have some sort of correspondence. The solution to this question is to compare the summary statistics inferred from the graphs. My thesis focus as a result is the geometric and topological inference to map from com these complex networks to these summary statistics. There are many applications of them. For instance, we can compare the social networks for user A and the social networks for user B. Uh, we can also compare the functional brain connectivity during a certain task versus how it is in this resting state. Or we could also compare the gene regulatory networks in a healthy individual versus one in a cancer patient. As an application domain, my thesis concerns with this cognitive and systems neuroscience problem. It's known that a fundamental challenge for systems neuroscience is how to quantitatively relate its three major branches of research, basically brain activity measurements, behavior measurements, and computational modeling, i.e. how is cognition implemented in the brain. So to solve this problem, we must first build computational models that can perform this type of cognitive tasks. It should be some sort of mechanistic or generative model, like a deep neural networks model. So here is the process. We have a pool of behavior conditions. There could be a pool of images that we want to show the subjects. We simultaneously would record their brain activities. At the same time, we also fed the same set of behavior condition to the computational models, and we also measure their activities. In the neural network, those would be the activations in certain layers. In order to compare, we quickly notice the problems here. Activity profiles are usually very high dimensional tensors, and their dimensionalities are different. For instance, in the brain, the different brain regions have different number of neurons. Or if you use different type of data collection techniques, EEG or fMRI, they have different number of voxels or channels. While in the neural networks, you might have layers that have different number of neurons or different output channels. Therefore, there is a dimensionality inconsistency here that we cannot effectively compare them one to one. So the overall measure of success 
Number one would be how to enable the comparison of brain activities and computational models with different number of units. The solution we have is to compare the representations. If we consider those activity profiles here, they're high dimensional tensors. However, they could compute the dissimilarities or similarities between the activity profiles of, say, two different stimuli. In this case, the brain activities or the response pattern of a neural net when seeing a dog versus seeing a cat, or the differences between the brain activity of seeing a dog versus seeing a tree. And soon we would have a distance matrix. We call them representational dissimilarity matrix. Having this representational dissimilarity matrix, now they are in the same dimensions. We can compare the representational space effectively. But again, if we pose this back to the complex network problem setting that we have earlier, we quickly notice that the representational space should be high dimension. And when we are collapsing it into a distance matrix, we're doing a very simple aggregation, which is basically to compute the second momentum of the activity profiles. Uh, are there a better way we can do geometric and topological inference and come up with better summary statistics? So the overall measure of success number two is to find better summary statistics that can help us compare different computational models with the brain activities. So the methodological statement would be, we propose to explore these summary statistical descriptions of representations in models and brains as part of a broader class of, of statistics that emphasize the topology as well as the geometry of the representations. More specifically, we want to develop novel analysis for representational geometry, topology, dynamics, and information. In the following session, we will see that through a series of geometric topological inference techniques, we accomplish both the measure of success one by dealing with the dimensionality inconsistent issue and also the measure of success number two, which is it, it is a better summary statistic than the geometry by itself. So the first part, let's consider these four points. It, again, it offers the networks and the geometry in our cases would be this distance matrix. And the topology, there are many definitions of topology, but in this case, we consider it as a graph. And the graph, the adjacency matrix, is a binary case determining whether two points are connected or not. In this case, it's A and B, because they are so close to each other, they can consider to be one node. From an information theoretical point of view, we can also consider that the distance that is very big doesn't carry much information for the mutual information between them if we consider them to have isotropic noise. When the noise increases, but we do not know the noise level, so the distances that is very small could imply these points are in the neighborhood and can be considered as the same point, while the intermediate distances carry most dependency-related information. As a result, maybe it will be best to use some sort of geotopological transform that basically transforms the big distance to infinity and small distance to zeros. And this is our formulation. So in this case, it's a simplification that any distance that is smaller than lower bound L will be considered zero. Anything bigger than U, upper bound U, will be considered as the maximum. Intermediate distance will be stretched. Of course, you can also have other formulation as long as you have the same intuition. It can also be approximated by any monotonic function, like a monotonic neural net. And by varying the lower bound L and upper bound U, we now have a family of this type of 3D transformations. And that can potentially give us some interpretations that are quite useful. For instance, on the, on the, on the top left corner, you have lower bound to be zero and upper bound to be one. That is exactly the entire geometry conserved. But if you see the upper bound L and lower bound U are actually in the identity line, then it will be kind of like it's binary. So it's kind of like just doing the thresholding function to the distances. So they are more topologically sensitive. And the smaller it is to the scale, the more emphasized it has on local information versus global information. So how useful is this summary statistics? We test this dual topological transform on the problem of independence test, which is actually the most important notion of probability theory. So here's the overview of existing method. The history of independence test, if we have univariate type of method, which tends to be very limited in their statistical power, other than linear relationship, and there are energy-based methods, like distance correlation, which are very effective in high dimensional linear cases. And there are kernel-based methods, which are quite useful for low dimensional nonlinear. And there are point cloud-based methods. They are good, but they are also very computationally expensive. And there are other methods proposed, which are quite inconsistent in following work. So we want a summary statistics that is very robust and consistent and expressive for complex patterns, can remove or interpret noises and inefficient to compute, as well as 
comparable across modalities. This is very important because all those methods I just described earlier, they are only good for one class of things, but they are not very adaptive. And that is really related to an important notion in statistics, which is no free lunch. As we will see later, that so in this project, the specific measure of success is to find an association measure that maintains a large statistical power in the following scenarios. One, a wide range of realistic nonlinear patterns. Two, resilient to different noise levels. Three, multivariate compatible with different dimensions. Four, offers interpretable insights about underlying patterns and five, consistent with different sample size. The statistical power here, I want to point out the definition here, is the fraction of true data set yielding a statistical value greater than 95% of the values yielded by the corresponding new data set by controlling a false positive rate of 5%. Here we propose adaptive geotopological independence criteria. It uses the backbone of a distance correlation, and that is formulated in these slides. We change the formulation of distance correlation by applying a functional, in this case, this is the GT transform function, towards all the distances when we are computing the distance covariance. Therefore, the distance correlation now, given our specific GT transform, becomes the following notations. And how does the adaptive way come in? So for X and Y, we first compute the pairwise distance given any matrix. And then, for each pair of threshold and U, we use the GT transform distance as the base and compute the local correlation given any distance based measure. In this case, distance correlation. Finally, to get our adaptive statistics, find a smoothed maximum, which is formulated in the following way. Of course, we can also have other subroutines. For instance, we can compute the inflation of these statistics instead of the statistics itself and try to find the maximum of that. Or we could also have additional noise normalization method to comment on top of the procedure. The complexity is okay, but we can even do better by just doing the sampling and it is theoretically shown to also converge to the respective AGTIC. The way that we do perform the independence test is with permutation. So basically we want to reject the new hypothesis that they are independent. We do that by computing n times R2 obtain the distribution of a statistics of the current data set D and also the statistics of the new data set from the new distribution. And we can estimate the p-value, type 1 error, and type 2 error and so as to com compute the statistical power of our statistics. Here is an intuitive example. We have on the left, we have a linear case. On the right, we have a spiral. And we also saw all the distances being plotted, basically in the x and y. While all the dots are every distances and orange ones are the part that is thresholded by our AGTIC. So it only sees the orange part. And we see that in a linear case, both method, both the distance correlation and AGTIC finds their patterns, which is expected. But in the spiral cases, distance correlation entirely misses dependency, while the AGTIC finds it without problem. We perform a systematic investigation of the performance by directly computing against noise level, sample size, different dimensions and interplay between different patterns. And we first find that it is very robust over different noise levels. In this five real-world type of data set, we see that AGTIC performs the best in most cases. And also, it is robust over different sample and dimension sizes. And in these cases, we have this type of dependency interference where, for instance, L dash L means that the first dimension is linear, second dimension is linear, L dash P means that the first dimension is linear, second dimension is parabola, so on and so forth. So we see that even if two dimensions are interfering with one another, our method can adaptively find the best solution. And also we find that our AGTIC map can be interpretable in certain ways. So shown here are the threshold searching map, where the X are the monotonic transform form pairs of L and U for the dimension dimension x and y-axis is the monotonic transformation for y. Here are some examples. If you look at linear patch patterns, we see this type of large distance range to be identified as the optimal thresholding. While when you see skeleton patterns, it usually emphasizes small distance range, like the L and U are very close to one another. If we have cyclic pattern, like sinusoidal or cosine functions, we can see this type of grid-like structure. And you can even see different frequencies by, ju by just looking at this type of threshold searching map. And we also find that similar dependency offers similar maps. Like the step function and exponential function are geometrically very similar, despite they are analytically distinct. We also apply to neural data. In this case, it's a functional MRI brain activity data from the human subjects. And we see that blockwise mutual information among the sets of brain regions are identified. 
Conclusion. We presented the family of GT independence criteria with adaptive method and its distance matrix based dependency estimation. It is theoretically sound. It is also empirically robust. And how does that match our specific measure of success? It turns out it checks all the list. So the next step would be to compare brain computational models. Shown here is a similar plot as we shown earlier, where all the dots represent the representational space. And different colors indicate different categories. Maybe one category is our faces, one category is our trees. And then we notice that they are organized in different ways. And we are also visualizing the heat map of this distance matrix, which we call representational dissimilarity matrix. We can also alternatively explore their topologies, like are there any nodes there, are there any lines, or are there any holes over there? So here is the pipeline of computing representational similarity. When we see different stimuli, we have different activity patterns being recorded from different brains, different model, different brain regions. And then we compute the representational dissimilarity matrix. Because the dissimilarity matrix are in the same dimension, we can compare them effectively with any type of similarity map. Recently, there are also interest in doing canonical correlation analysis of the activity pattern level. And also there are ways that tries to bridge the both, like distance correlation as well as AGTIC that we just proposed. But there has been problems with existing method. For instance, there has been shown that deep neural net all predict human inferior temporal cortex brain activity pretty well so it's very hard to distinguish among them and also if you have different differences of rdms it's very subtle to naked eyes across different brain regions this was amplified even by the even by the problems of intrinsic cortical dynamics it can strongly affect the representational geometry and thus increasing the idiosyncrasy between the subjects and also we usually visualize this type of representational geometries with multi-dimensional scaling to reveal interpretable semantic information but if the labeling is not informative then we basically cannot learn much from those type of visualizations so the measure of success in this case would be we would want to find the summary statistics that characterize it representational space such that different computational models are distinguishable from one another. Different brain regions are distinguishable from one another. Idiosyncrasy between the subjects and sessions are abstracted out and removes different levels of noise that resides in the collected data. And also, it offers intuitive insights in the dimension reduction visualizations. So back to the GT similarity. We know that the Pearson, Spearman, and Cordell correlations are all cosine, are all computed on the RDMs. And these RDMs can be GT transformed in certain ways. So on the right is the transformed dissimilarity matrices. And if we double center in the RDMs, the cosine distance is equivalent to the distance correlation, and as a result, the GT similarity of such would be equivalent to the AGTIC between activity profiles. All of this has been implemented in RSA Toolbox, where I am a main contributor of. Feel free to check it out. Here we also apply it to neural data. So here is a human fMRI experiments where the human beings are viewing 62 different images. And on the left, we have the accuracy map of the thresholding function. And we see that the best performing one is not a full geometry. And as a result, we did distinguish brain regions better than the traditional method. And also, on the right, we compute the within region of interest distance and across region of interest distance. We do find that when we are applying the representational geotopological matrix, we did separate those brain regions much better in most cases. We also applied the same method on deep neural network model by initializing 10 different random seeds. We see that if you look at the representational geotopologic matrices, we see that the representational spaces of the same layer are clustered more tightly together than the ones where we use the full geometry. So if we go back to our specific measure of success, it checks all the marks. For the following sections, for the time sake, we will not have time to go over other projects in this line of work, such as higher order topological simulation analysis, as well as the representational dynamics in different ways, and also representational information. Thank you. For more details, please refer to our work. Please feel free to contact me at baihanling at columbia.edu.